Welcome everybody to our city council regular meeting on May 4th at 7 p.m. Thank you for coming in. Um, could we please uh, stand up for our Pledge of Allegiance? Ready, begin. Can you guys please remain standing for a moment of silence for our first responders and military members? Thank you. You may be seated. Monica, can we get roll call, please? Roll call. Council Member Soto? Present. Council Member Moran? Present. Council Member Kane? Present. Mayor Pro Temp Garcia? Mayor Pro Temp Garcia? Mayor Aguilar? Present. For the record, Mayor Pro Tem Garcia is not in attendance, but his absence is excused. In regards to closed session announcements, there's no reportable action. Council, is there any changes to the agenda? Uh, yes, if I may request uh, to move items uh, 10 and 11 right after between 7 and 8. Sounds good. We'll make those changes. So it's, it'll be 7, 10, 11? Uh, yes, 7, 10, 11, 8, 9. Okay, and then I have actually another um, change on item number 8. Uh, I would like to table this, this item uh, for further evaluation and assessment. I know, number 8? Um, I know there were a, a few applicants regarding this position, um, and I appreciate everybody's uh, wanting to participate and get involved. Um, I think there were some concerns in regards to actually the language, uh, how the makeup of the of the board is or the commission. So we're going to look at it further, and we'll bring it back uh, during our next meeting. Any further changes? No. We're good. Yeah, we can, yeah. Item number eight for the next meeting, yeah. Okay, no further changes, council. We're gonna go ahead and move on to awards, presentations, and proclamations. We have one item, a presentation by Tracy Norris, Corporation, Corporate Com Communications. Mayor, approach Yeah. Okay. Yilton Solid Waste Management, Inc., SB 1383 Implementation Strategies for the City of Livingston. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jilton, the owner of Jilton Waste Management. So thank you very much for being here. Looking forward to uh, having, looking at seeing again your presentation and strategy of implementation. Thank you. Great. Is the council okay if I take my mask off while I present? Yeah. Thank you. Well, on behalf of Jilton, I would like to thank the council for time on the agenda to discuss our strategy with you. Um, and let me, I got to do the little mechanics here. Okay, so tonight I would like to go over uh, just recycling, briefly recycling legislation, prior recycling, um, give you a brief summary of SB 1383, talk about a high diversion material recovery facility and what that is, or a MRF, um, talk about our composting facility, get into our recommended approach, and then answer any questions that you might have. So really this evening we wanna talk about why we're here, and that's about a partnership. You know, we have uh, successfully partnered with you on all prior recycling uh, legislation. Uh, you should have received, each of you, a letter from Richard in January, kind of going over those legislatives, uh, those legislative initiatives in detail. I'll briefly touch on them now. Uh, AB 939, Integrated Waste Management Act, which required each city or county to reduce material going into the landfill by 50%. And, a lot, this particular mandate prompted a lot of jurisdictions to implement curbside recycling at this time. 
That was followed up by AB 341, mandatory commercial recycling, in which all businesses in those multifamily units of five or greater that generated four or more cubic yards of solid waste were required to recycle. And that was starting to focus on uh, reducing our gas emissions. And then more recently, AB 1826, mandatory organics recycling, in which any business generating organic waste was required to divert that waste and um, get it out of the landfill and turn it into compost. And really with SB Robert 13... Wallace. With SB 1383, we, we want this piece of legislation to be no differently. We want to continue our partnership with the city of Livingston and give you the assurance of uh, knowing that we're going to provide you the level of service that you've come to expect from our company. So SB 1383 is the most significant waste reduction mandate to be adopted in the state of California in the last 30 years. And at Jilton, the way we like to think about SB 1383 is the Pac-Man from the video from the 80s, if you all can remember that. It's come along and gobbled up all of those prior recycling mandates that I just reviewed with you. SB 1383, which is an unfunded state mandate, establishes a statewide target to decrease the methane gas that's being emitted from our landfills by diverting the disposal of organic waste going into those landfills by 75% by the year 2025. And beginning in 2025 and beyond, California is allowed to dispose of only 5.7 million tons or less of organic waste annually. To put the enormity of this task in perspective, California disposed of approximately 27 million tons of organic waste in 2017. So in other words, Californians must reduce the organic waste being disposed by 20 million tons annually. So a pretty big lift. And then just by way of clarification, SB 1383 defines organic waste to include green materials, wood waste, fibers such as paper and cardboard, food scraps, food soiled paper, and then also landscaping and pruning waste. So just a few key dates related to SB 1383 implementation. Um, just here coming up in 2022, the regulations become enforceable and jurisdictions are going to be looked to to have their programs in place. Two years after that, jurisdictions are going to be looked at to enforce, uh, provide enforcement against any of those entities that aren't complying with SB 1383 mandates. And then one year after that, in 2025, collectively as, as a state, we've got to demonstrate to Cal Recycle in the state that we're diverting that 75% uh, diversion level of our, our, our organics. So jurisdictions will be required to adequately resource each of these six programs. And Jilton is here, as I've indicated, with the red circle to help you provide organic waste collection to your residences and your businesses. So I want to get into talking about organic collection service and what that looks like. So two of the main, there's really two main collection services. One is the three can service, which requires material to be separated at the source or what they referred to as source separated. And this particular um, collection service re relies on our generators, our residences and our businesses to correctly sort their waste and get it in the, the right cans. There's also the two container service with, which Jilton currently provides. And this under SB 1383, under a two container service, that black can or that mixed organics can as being required to go to a high diversion material recovery facility to remove that organic content. And this particular service level uses mechanical separation to ensure that the waste streams are being adequately separated and that the waste is being diverted. But what the presentation will show is that even in a three can service, mechanical separation of waste is necessary to achieve the 75% diversion level that we're being required to do. So both history and our recent waste characteristic studies have shown us that relying solely on our residences and our businesses to separate organic waste or organic material is not enough to achieve those 1383 mandates. Therefore, therefore, in the residential and commercial organic material stream, we are shifting our focus from customers and drivers for correct separation to mechanical separation of material. A high diversion MRF is in fact necessary to achieve that 75% diversion level and to give us the cleaner compost. 
And going to a three-cart collection sy system, excuse me, will not alleviate the contamination problem because we cannot effectively control what individuals put in each of the respective cans. Uh, this is seen in the Bay Area where we all know that zero waste and being very, you know, economically and environmentally sound is a, is a huge focus over there. Uh, waste management companies in the Bay Area that are on a three-cart system take those three carts to their high diversion material recovery facility and pull out, pull out the organics and separate their waste um, at their high diversion MRF. And to see this in action, we have a video of what a high diversion MRF can do to our material streams that's in San Jose. Have you ever... Oh, well. No, hold on. Can you do it on your side? Thank you. Operator. Have you ever wondered what happens to your household garbage after it's collected? Green Waste Recovery is a collection and processing provider for several California communities and operates a materials recovery facility, MRF for short, in San Jose. Come along with us for a tour of the facility. It all starts at the scale house, where trucks must be weighed before being directed to their designated tipping floor. The tipping floor is where trucks dump the material they've collected. There are two tipping floors. In the Municipal Solid Waste MSW building, one is for garbage collected from houses and the other is for garbage collected from apartment complexes. The tipping floor is a large open space where trucks can easily offload and material can be easily moved. Green waste employees set aside any large or bulky items for processing. The remaining debris is loaded with a tractor into the metering bin. The metering bin provides an effective way of feeding material into the material recovery system. A rotating drum with hammer bits begins opening bags while regulating material flow. The first stop for the debris is the pre-sort station. Here, manual sorters stand by the conveyor belt to remove large items and contaminants by hand. These items are tossed into openings that lead down to bunkers for storage. The material continues up to screens where the material from both lines merge. The screens separate the material by size. The top conveyor separates items that are 6 inches or larger in size. The middle conveyor separates materials between 6 inches and 2 inches in size. Everything smaller than 2 inches in size falls to the lower conveyor. Food scraps such as apple cores, eggshells, and chicken bones end up on this line. The top and center conveyor streams continue for further processing. The lower conveyor, which has organics and compostable material, is sent to the compost pile. Next is the Nihat air separator, which separates light and heavy materials. The air separator unit uses gravity and an air blower to separate material based on density. The light items are transported over the machinery and continue onto the polishing screens. The heavier items fall to the lower conveyor down to the compost stream for further processing. The heavy items on the compost line proceed to a huge magnet which removes metals from the stream. Then, the material flows through our dual arm Max AI, which removes plastics and aluminums from the stream. Manual sorting is the final quality control before this stream goes to the compost pile. The lighter material makes its way to the polishing screens, where spinning discs send all fibers such as paper, cardboard, and newsprint over the top while all bottles and other remaining recyclables fall back to continue through the process. Next are the four optical sorters. The optical sorters have sensors that tell the equipment which material it needs to send over. With a shot of air, the plastic is ejected over while the rest of the material falls and continues through the process. While plastics and paper are being identified, aluminum is also sorted. The eddy current separator has a strong magnetic belt. This causes non-ferrous metals to go flying over and separated into its own stream, which ends in a bunker. As material nears the end of its journey, it arrives at the four Max AI units. The Max AIs are programmed to identify specific material types and extract anything that does not belong in the stream. These items then fall into bunkers separated by commodity. Once the process is over, recyclables are bailed and sold to be recycled. So this video illustrates what happens to the material stream when it's taken to a high diversion MRF and you know put across the belt and all these you know equipment is properly sorting it. It's, it's pretty impressive to see, really. Have you ever wondered what happened? Here we go. That's where we need to be. So Jilton Solid Waste is taking a more thoughtful, strategic approach to find a long-term sustainable solution to SB 1383 mandates. 
While we do strongly believe in supporting our and educating our um, customers and promoting proper waste segregation reci and recycling, doing this alone has proven not to be enough to effectively achieve the mandate. And to be able to pull out that organic waste and adequately divert it and repurpose it. So the long-term solution, we believe, is to have our waste material separated in a mechanical way. Therefore, we are proposing to build a high diversion material recovery facility and a composting facility at our McClure Road property. Having these facilities will allow our, the jurisdictions that we serve to comply with SB 1383 mandates. Our McClure Road property is permitted to build a high diversion MRF currently. Our transfer station at McClure has been in place for 30 years, so we will need to invest in newer equipment than we have today to be able to process the necessary tonnages going forward. We are also performing our own waste characteristic studies to help us determine which equipment, yeah, which pieces of equipment we will need to adequately process and sort the materials. But the bottom line is that the material has to be clean. The state of California will only allow 1% contamination before materials can be placed in a windrow at a composting facility. And we believe that the technology that we invest in will allow us to achieve these levels. Because composting is, in fact, a critical component in the management of organics. Our, McC our McClure Road site, um, our current permit allows us to compost 470 tons per day or 122,000 tons per year, which is much more than all of our cities would produce now and into the future. We are one of only 35 composting facilities in this state that can accept food as well. So we have the space and capacity for a composting facility, and our investment into the new GORE technology satisfies both the California Air and Water Boards, which will allow us to effectively and efficiently run our composting facility. So in conclusion, Jilton believes that the most cost-effective approach is the two-cart system that we currently have, rather than investing, excuse me, and investing also into becoming a high diversion material recovery facility, rather than putting and investing money into purchasing more carts and um, trucks to get, you know, to collect all those carts. Um, a high diversion MRF gives us more flexibility to take care of both our commercial and our residential customers as these processes, as you saw, are capable of pulling off the organics materials as well as the recyclables and also process any additional materials to, avoid diver to allow for diversion and avoid it going into the landfill. Our new composting facility gives you the assurance that you have secured capacity in the future. So we believe that both solutions taken together ensures that the highest amount of material is clean, uh, diverted, and repurposed. So with that, we'd like to uh, discuss any questions you might have about our approach. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you, Denise, and also uh, Mr. Jilchin and Richard mm -hmm. for being here. In terms of uh, providing a little bit more of a, a, a a little more a meat to all of this um, and why this is very important. So one, it's very important to the city of Livingston for several reasons and we appreciate your guys presenting tonight. And that is because our contract with Jilton is up in December of 2022. So we're gonna have to uh, decide about uh, you know sending out an RFP, what are we gonna do uh, towards the end of this year because okay. it takes quite a bit of long time to uh, go through the process through right. the contract. But more importantly, is highlighting the, the importance and the, and the investments that a lot of uh, firms like Jilton is doing to meet the uh, SB 1383. Currently, H&M uh, is doing uh, some, well, let me see, is Anthony here? Yeah, Anthony. So I won't steal your thunder if you want to talk a little bit about um, what's going on with H&M and um, what we're doing uh, as it relates to SB 1383. We're in, uh, keep in mind that we're doing the utility rates, uh, which are coming up this year. And we've actually, we don't know the cost, but we've taken a pretty a guess of about $100,000 plus uh, to try to address this because there's a timeline. So go ahead, Anthony. Yeah, so HF and, and uh, H. Uh, was the uh, they, they finished their their uh, uh, report already, and uh, they will be I believe uh, we're going to request them to um, present to council as well their findings. So expect uh, a future presentation from H 
um, F and H uh, to, to counsel. Anything else you want me to cover, Jose? Uh, no, uh, that, that's that's perfect. Thank you. So, so again, for for counsel, uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that uh, uh, that Jilton was given an opportunity to come and 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 let everybody know what Jilton is doing and what they're how they're looking at the future and what they're looking at it, uh, investing some capital in. And so, we very much appreciate uh, you guys taking time to come out this evening. And as you see, we are in a tight timeline there. We have till uh, January 1st of 2022 to start implementation and adopting ordinances and uh, uh, re requirements, enforcement requirements as well. And staff is currently uh, preparing those documents and ordinances as well. And so the new RFP that we'll be sending out, we're going to make sure that it incorporates all the different elements associated with SB 1383. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, very informative, appreciate it. Uh, Council, do you guys have any questions or comments? Um, both uh, comments, well, first of all, thank you for the uh, presentation, very informational. And a uh, quick question, and, and I think based on your presentation, you uh, uh, focus on the importance of educating the community, uh, because without it, it would be a little bit more difficult or more, I mean, not as cost effective and uh, a little bit more difficult to uh, meet the deadlines. So in regards to marketing and educating the community, what do you have planned? Um, well, the, this was the, the letter that you received. The, the bill went into, to, uh, was signed by the governor in uh, November, and we've seen that, okay, it's, it's real now. We got a big uh, hill to climb here, a lot of education that's gonna have to take place. Uh, so you folks are, uh, the councils and staff are, are the front lines in, in the cities. And uh, you, you folks have multi things to, to do and work, work about. Uh, we focus on this. This is what we do every day. So we prepared the letter to kind of get everybody going. There's a lot of elections just took place. A lot of new council people, uh, staff people, throughout all of our uh, areas that we serve. And so we've been just making our rounds, doing this first level of what we call, well, actually it's our second level of education. We, we started with, with staff and having Zoom meetings and, and then getting a presentation, either Zoom or live with our city councils. And um, <clears throat> then the next step is to start looking at, okay, what system are we gonna really uh, go in on here um, and we've, we're, we're working with that. We have a team of uh, 12 people at our organization that we're meeting once a week and we're all going different ways and getting different information and bringing it back and, and trying to come up with the best solution and plan for the communities that we serve. And then a big piece of that's gonna be the next step. We gotta start educating the public once we have decided as a, a council body um, and ourselves, what's the best solution to go and how are we gonna educate these folks? And Because that's a big, big part of it. Richard, um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of folks here are wondering, look, given the big capital investment and the goals that we need to meet under SB 1383, in terms of economic, uh, financial impact that it could have, to the rates that current um, residents pay, not only here, but in other communities. Just, I don't know, a percentage, a ballpark. I won't hold you to it, but just curious. And that is a typical answer or question to ask at one of these presentations. We're not at the point, we're still gathering information on what kind of equipment we need. Like uh, Tracy spoke about doing waste characteristics. We have actually went through uh, uh, say a community's route will take a route of 28, 30,000 pounds of residential waste and we're running that across the belt. We've, we've done uh, routes of two or three times to get the statistics of how much organics is in there, how much is, is landfill stuff, how much can be recycled. Uh, getting that kind of material and data together to help us make that decision and then do we need 
15 conveyor belts or can we do it with five conveyor belts? What's our, you know, what's our staffing? How many robotic uh, arms can we, can we uh, work on that? What products do we really need to tackle? Because there's, like you've seen on that, there was several different machines that, that uh, pull out certain products and that's all they do. We may not need that because everybody's waste stream has a little bit of different characteristics to it. We have found City of Escalon, Riverbank, um, Gustine, Livingston, uh, City of Modesto, um, Waterford, City of Houston are some of the communities that we serve. You pretty much have some of the same characteristics on what the people in those communities are putting in their, in their green can or their trash can. So you're normal. <laughs> <laughs> so you, everybody here is normal. But I mean, it, it, it varies from like the picture we saw in, in San Jose where they have maybe a different thing taking place. Uh, more people redeem the recyclables at a buyback center in our regions. So you don't see the bottles and cans that you might see in some of these other neighborhoods kind of thing. So it, it, it's all that putting together to try to find that number. We do know from the numbers we've ran Three trucks running up and down the street picking up three different cans and putting the extra cans out there is going to cost more than some of our options we have with the machinery. So we know those kind of things are taking place. Plus, we as trash hauler trucks are going to have to go to be going to electric trucks by 2025. And right now, electric truck is probably running around $200,000 more than what the trucks were running up and down the road right now. We don't know how, you know, right now we can run a truck 10, 12, 14 hours a day if need be or whatever. We don't know how long was that battery on that truck gonna get us almost home and it's gonna run out, how we, you know. So there's are things that we have to learn, but we do know that cost is gonna be there. And so those are things that you got the environment of, of uh, the trucks, the, the, the uh, exposure, the, what we're finding in some communities, they say, we don't want three cans because of the can blight. You know, it's, you got cans lined up on your streets all the way from one end to the next, and where are you gonna store it behind your fence or, you know, all those kind of things. So there's a lot of other issues that'll take place in some of this decision-making process. Sorry for the long answer. Perfect, thank you so much. Any further questions, comments? Are you? Council on the phone, any questions? Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank appreciate you for letting us have the opportunity to do that. We appreciate you folks, and we're glad to be part of this community. Any comments from the public? I see one. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council. I realize solid waste is usually not a very sexy question to ask, but I do have a couple of them. And maybe part of it I missed in the presentation. I was kind of doing some work as at the same time. Uh, this single stream recycling has been in process for a long, long time. It's good to see that it's finally starting to get implemented. Uh, the question I have is, and then this is where I missed it, you're still proposing to have a two can. One of, of course is for uh, reg regular waste and one is for compost green waste. Is that correct? Is there a reason why you're still going to, and this is where I missed it, is there a reason why you're still going to two can instead of one can? Uh, and then I'll, I'll just ask all my questions, you can just answer my ones out, just to save time, okay? And then uh, second is uh, uh, the recyclables, when they get sent to somewhere to distribution, wherever they get sent, uh, who gets the revenue? Uh, I don't know if you mentioned that in there. Does, the, does Jilton get the revenue or the the company or does it come back to the jurisdictions? And, and then if it does, what happens because there seems to be a glut of recyclables now. Uh, China doesn't want it, nobody wants it. So do, does it come back to the jurisdictions to be having to, the rate payers to be picking up because now you can't get rid of it? So those are some of the questions. I know you're probably not prepared if you're not. You know, maybe you can answer uh, during the, you know, I know that we're gonna go through RFP pro process here for Aon, the city has to do that. So perhaps, 
council can uh, hold those questions at the time, maybe ask them, you know. I think it is critical. Uh, and then uh, I personally believe that it should be just one can because there's almost so much cross-contamination to begin with. We're, we're, at our home, we're horrible too. You know, a regular can gets full, it goes in the, uh, in the green. The green gets full, it goes in the other one. You know, so we're not the only ones doing it. And, and another question to meet our 50% diversion, this is my last question, is how does Fosto Farms, which does a huge amount of recycling, how does that impact us as a city? Are we able to take them into account to meet our 50% uh, diversion to the uh, landfills? And also, the last question now is, uh, Jolton, or the city has a contract with uh, MCAG for landfill. Uh, how does that affect that? So, because if the reduce, capacity reduces, uh, you know, so that, there's a lot of questions that you guys need to ask. So please, keep on top of it. I know you guys will. So uh, thank you very much for your time. And I know the clock didn't run, but I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the present. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'll try to remember live in order, but some of remind me. Um, the first question was um, the one can. Right now, the, 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 the law states that we either have two cans or three cans. So that's kind of driving that. We don't disagree with you, but that's how the, the, the uh, SB 1383 is written. So that's why we're, we're looking at those two options in, in, in that. The second question was, um, which one? One of the questions was with the recycling, where? Oh, where's the, where recyclables go? That was, I think that was the last question. But the, the, um, there is a glutton. Um, we have been, uh, we haven't, but there's been a lot of communities that have been shipping what we consider trash to China. Hello. In a place I'm, like I'm new to the conference call. My name is Lori Chavez. I run Atwater Community Cat Hello, Network. We're you, a spade and neuter, phone? trap spade neuter here in Atwater. Hello? I was on the wrong access code talking to somebody else. <laughs> Can you please mute your phone? I think you're on the wrong call, conference call. Thank Are you. Are you Livingston? As the city of Livingston. We're in, we're in the middle of a council meeting. This was the number I was supposed to call. Do I just sit here and listen to you? Is that what my, my deal is? Are you trying to attend a council meeting? I am. I'm trying to um, uh, speak up for the spade and neuter program. Okay, yeah, we're not in that item yet. Could you just please mute okay. your phone until Does we get there? Okay, just Okay, no problem. Thank you. Where was I at? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the recycling then, is going into China. There was a lot of uh, communities in California that were trying to stay in so-called be green and we're shipping a lot of garbage, in, I, in, in my opinion, to China, calling it recyclables, but they weren't doing a very good job at cleaning this product up and making it, making it work right. So there is a glut in there. Um, we encourage people to take their redeemable stuff to buyback centers. You paid for it when you bought it, get your money back when you get done with that container. We encourage that. Um, that pricing is gonna be a fluctuating kind of thing. Uh, when commodities become something, it can help lower our cost, and those are things that are gonna be beneficial back to the, the customer. Prices go up, we still are mandated no matter what we do, we gotta pull that material out of the landfill. So it's kind of a give and take situation that is uh, a moving target. Hard, hard one, but it, it will, that all goes into the, to the effect. But what we have found in all the cities that we have surveyed in the route waste characteristics of the recyclable content in a load is only about four to five percent of that material of that is in there. So people are redeeming their material. Uh, they're either giving it to the the kids next door, or they're doing it themselves, or they're giving it to the grandkids, or they're taking, you know, giving it to a nonprofit group or whatever, somebody's taking care of it some way, somehow. And, and I can say that AB 2020 was the bottle bill that, that happened back in the uh, in 90s. Uh, it works. It has worked. So you can say we have a lot of bills and a lot of laws. That law worked. I can say it does. And 
What was one of the other questions? Um, Good. Okay. Did I miss? Did, is any? Is anything else I need to answer? Thank you so much. I'm going to move on to announcements and reports. Uh, we have our supervisor, Rodrigo Espinosa, here. Good evening, Council. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Mr. Jilton for, um, you know, providing a, a service, a good service to uh, our community for many years. And uh, it seems like yesterday we renewed the contract and uh, it's up again, so 10 years. Or five, I think it's five, ten years already. Wow! Uh, but thank you, sir, for uh, a good job here in, in Livingston. So, and also thank you, Council, for uh, uh, taking off the evaluation for the city manager. I just want to stress that you know Jose Ramirez is doing a good job here in the city of Livingston, and uh, that we're uh, hopefully can be here for a lot longer. Uh, and with that, also I move on to uh, the ACE train, also working together with. The city manager, uh, for the last few years, um, we've been working on a train station here in Livingston, the ACE train, that will be coming down from, uh, from Modesto to Ceres to uh, Turlock and then uh, Livingston and uh, eventually Merced. So uh, there was a, uh, I guess you can call it still a struggle for uh, a station here, uh, Livingston or Atwater. Uh, but uh, thankfully, there was a uh, environmental that went out by the ACE train, and uh, you know Livingston was mentioned as an environmental process that being done for Livingston, so that hopefully uh, Livingston will attain the train station here, and we'll have a train station here at uh, the Manuel Vieira A.V. Thomas uh, site right there next to the rail track. So we're hoping for that, and uh, unless anything changes, uh, we'll keep fighting for that. Uh, also, you know, like, as I represent uh, the county on the, the on the San Joaquin Joint Valley's Powers Authority, and uh, which is part of the Amtrak and the A train, the A train, uh, hopefully we'll fight to uh, maintain that the Livingston gets that site. So this is tremendous with all the growth, future growth here in Livingston, apartments close to uh, downtown. Uh, I think the you know residents and future residents will be able to go wherever south through uh, the high-speed rail, uh, Amtrak, or ACE train, uh, whether it's the Bay Area and uh, Sacramento or to the south. So we're looking forward to that. Um, also, I want to speak on you know vaccine hesitancy. Um, there's um, hopefully more people can just continue pushing the vaccines. Please uh, call your family and make sure that people go down and get their vaccines, uh, no matter what the age is. Uh, it's all free. Uh, you, you know. You're not supposed to be charged. You know, I know some people haven't gotten bills, but let me know if there's any uh, anyone that, that that gets a bill. I'll be glad to uh, see where it's at, and uh, we can take that uh, take care of that. Um, at the, in the Atwater Community Center, there'll be uh, daily. They'll, they'll be providing 400 vaccines there um, on Bellevue Road. I, I don't remember right now the, the address, but uh, the community center. Can you please mute your phone? Hello? Can you please mute your phone or your device? Thank you. Um, also, last meeting, I addressed that uh, I would like to see it in a, uh, an inclusionary housing ordinance uh, for affordable homes in uh, on the county. I, I kind of regret that when I was here in, in Livingston, we we didn't uh, get that inclusionary housing for Livingston, so hopefully the future of this council can uh, move forward and, and uh, enact the uh, inclusionary housing. An inclusionary housing ordinance, so hopefully, Mayor and Council, you can look into that. Um, also, I addressed um, the, need, the need for a uh, moratorium on fireworks. I, I get a lot of complaints, my neighbors everywhere, all around, not just Livingston, but all around the county. I get calls, constant calls about, you know, people who are, with, they're having problems with their pets, being afraid or, you know, whatever issue. And also, uh, people just, you know, just like, like my back, uh, my subdivision getting, uh, you know, illegal fireworks. Here, uh, when I was in the council, we brought in the Saving Same Fireworks, but, you know, 
uh, that's not bad. But you know, that, with that comes uh, the illegal fireworks. So it, it just getting. It seems like it's getting worse every year and year. So you know, I called uh, last year. I called uh, past Mayor Gabal Samra, the chief of police, and and the city manager. But nothing was done about it. I was on F Street. I pointed to uh, for two hours. I sat same place watching the fireworks go up in the air and the officers didn't do anything so they were just going around and around but they were not going to a location so you know we can't that can't continue i think every year you know just you know you don't have to be any any party any weekend that's a holiday the fireworks are just going up you know illegal fireworks so i just want to make sure that you know that gets addressed and we'll see my colleagues in the county will be able to uh support a, a ban uh but you know there's there'll be a lot of discussion on it so we'll see also um with uh, Google Translate, I am uh, asking the, my board uh, supervisors to uh, have agendas in Spanish, Hmong, and Punjabi, which is real easy. You know, they can, it can be on the side of the regular agendas, and uh, if you put it on Google Translate, it'll translate 90% right away instantly, and somebody just has to go over and make sure that the rest is, you know, is, is uh, the same. And, you know, it shouldn't cost that much to translate in any language for that way. If you got residents that can come in and ask questions or concerns, uh, for any council or school district or whatever. So in the, in the county, I think it's, it's also, uh, well, um, and last, uh, with the general plan here in Livingston, uh, moving forward, hopefully, uh, I'm also asking the, the council to, uh, again, you know, I don't know where it's at, where you guys at with uh, revenue sharing agreement. I know that we in the county, we passed it. A couple of years ago, and uh, we don't want to lose, you know, being a resident of Livingston for a long time. Um, we're almost out of uh, housing developments, uh, land that would be available. So we need the general plan needs to in, increase moderately. Not, I don't want a big, you know, my opinion, not a big increase, just enough commercial and, and industrial for potential future jobs and for growth of, uh, of, of this community. So uh, thank you with that, and I'll take any questions if there's any questions by the council or the public. Council, any questions for a supervisor? Well, um, well, first of all, just thank you for the report. And, and, and I think you're right. Um, every week I also get complaints in regards to the fireworks. And often enough, sometimes they're also not only in the city but out in the county. And then again, there's only so much. I mean, there's only so much that, uh, that anyone can do unless there's something more strict done about it. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, I just remember something also too with uh, great service that Jilton does. Uh, sometimes people forget that uh, people have two times a year they can call Jilton and uh, for bulky items pick up on the on their sidewalk. So every home in Livingston has uh, they're paying the service uh, that has access to uh, for them to pick up uh, you know the bulky items. So uh, just uh, remember call it call in uh, in the city hall and they'll pick it up gladly. So thank you very much. Any further questions? Maria? Supervisor, um, you discussed the ACE train. I understand it's not, you know, we're not quite there yet, but are you considering any types of um, repercussions for transients? I know we're experiencing some, some homelessness and, and people just being dropped off. Are, the, are you guys, is that somewhere in your discussion, what, what counties would do? From recovering the whole center of, you know, of wide range, what are you guys planning in order to keep, you know, the flow of people going to their own residents in their own cities? Well, unfortunately, you know, we have a, uh, you know, it seems like it's getting worse in Turlock and Merced County all over. Uh, you know, we're just uh, trying to address as much as we can, but that's a, uh, I think it's a state problem, not a county problem. And, but as a county, we're, uh, we have the continuum of care and we're trying to address the homelessness as, as much as we can. So well, that's why we built the navigation center. Um, even though it was, you know, plus six million dollars, uh, you know, plus two million dollars of maintenance, you know, for, for, for a year. Uh, and the state's going to be paying, for, you know, paying us for that as well to maintain it. But, you know, uh, we can only address it. I know six million dollars could have bought a, a bigger property and remodeled and taken more people. But you know, I think every county is doing its best. But I think this is a whole county, the whole state problem, not just a, a, a small county, because we only have so much revenue, and the state, you know, has 
uh, I think they have a surface uh, surplus this year, uh, so uh, maybe they can address it uh, statewide, and you know, with purchasing properties, you know, or, or, or you know, uh, allocating uh, more money for counties so that we can buy more properties and uh, get that problem resolved. So, but I don't know uh, when it happen. So, thank you. Thank you. If if I may, just real quick. Um, sorry, and, and I forgot uh, this weekend. Uh, we had an opportunity to uh, visit a homeless camp uh, just outside of the city uh, in the county. If, if there's enough need from the city, can the city request to the county to, for the county to come over and do uh, some kind of cleanup in that area, or how, how does that work? Um, yes, I think together with um, either uh, the CHP and, and uh, Public Works, they can come in and and look at a problem. Just uh, we have uh, John uh, uh, Chicoli in charge of uh, the continual care. So uh, let me know, and I'll give you his number. That way, uh, they can, he can come over and look at it and see what we can do. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any yeah. other questions by the public? Just a yeah. quick comment. Um, thank you for putting in that Google form. You know, the idea for the Google form, all the translations, because again. Um, when we're talking about recycling and being really environmentally conscious and printing all that paper you know, or getting any mailings that have several languages. It's, it's a lot of work, costs a lot of money, and um, it just ends up not where it's supposed to be. So again, with our technology, Google Translate, it's not the best, but it's, it's, it's really going to solve a lot. Thank you. Yeah, I used to do it myself, and it would take me a long time, and then it was like, Somebody told me, oh, Google Translate, and I put it in, I just fix a few things, and, you know, it's pretty quick. So, thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. We're going to move on to city staff announcements and reports. Go ahead, Anthony. Public Works. Oh, Chief, you're going first? Oh. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, Council, members of the public. Uh, Council, I do have an informational update in regards to the uh, water vending machine. So we did find out that uh, oversight regulation, uh, oversight is regulated by the California Department of Public Health, the Food and Drug Branch. There's a few things that the city will have to uh, um, take care of. The first one is the city needs to fill out an application for a water vending machine operator license, which is only $40. Uh, submit a water vending machine locations report. Uh, schedule and pay for an inspection for the National Automatic Merchandising Association. Now, for new certification uh, per unit is uh, $2,750. Then annually after that, it's going to be anywhere from $1,500 to $2,250 per unit for annual recertification. Uh, city needs a test for coliform bacteria every, at least every six months in TDS when the unit is serviced. If the vended uh, water machine is labeled as purified, we are required to check TDS every time the unit is serviced, and it must not exceed uh, 10 milligrams per liter. It also must be equipped with shutdown devices to be used when disinfection unit fails to function or whenever the total dissolved solids content exceeds 10 milligrams per liter. Also, please keep in mind that uh, we do not know what treatment equipment is inside the unit, uh, or nor the availability, availability of parts or, or the servicing frequency at this time. Again, this is just an informational update to inform council on staff's findings. Staff, Thank you, Anthony. Any questions? Any questions from council regarding this item? Thank you, Anthony. I really appreciate the update on that. Uh, again, I this was a item that was graciously given over to by um, Mr. Alex McCabe. So again, these items down here, um, I will, I'll be sure to address them with him. Thank okay. you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. We have Tony from Recreation Department coming up. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, staff, Mine's quick. Um, just a few reminders. We have Cinco de Mayo coming up this Saturday, uh, May 8th. It'll be at the Max Foster Sports Complex. 
We will be having a car show and prizes and a DJ. So uh, we're still taking cars uh, to be registered. It's $15. Uh, we'll take them all the way up till May 7th. Um, you can call me or email me and uh, we can do credit card over the phone or you're more than welcome to come into City Hall to register as well. And then we also are taking vendors, it's $50. You will need to have insurance and there is no food provided. Taco Tuesday is May 18th. It is a centennial event to help fund that since it is not a um, budgeted item for us this year. But we are really excited. We've been working with the Historical Society and doing a lot of uh, exciting things, getting ready for our centennial in 2022. So this is going to help us facilitate our 2022 celebration. So please buy your ticket. You can see a council member, you can see recreation, or a centennial committee or a rec commissioner. Linda's uh, tried to outdo Councilman Moran <laughs> on selling the most tickets. <laughs> so far, I think Councilman Moran has won uh, the last time, so good luck. <laughs> But of course, if you need any other information or anything else about our programming, please give us a call at Recreation. We'll be glad to help you. Any questions? Thank you, Tony. Any questions from council? Thank you. Any other staff? No? Sounds good. We're gonna move on to city manager announcements and reports. Yes, Mr. Mayor and council and public, a few items that I wanna cover. One is I know that uh, supervisor brought up the uh, fireworks situation here in town. That has been an ongoing problem. We try to do the best we can in terms of educating the community. Uh, we've actually met um, on several occasions with, uh, believe it or not, we actually had some residents who were part of Paradise. You guys all remember the fire in Paradise that actually moved here to Livingston. And so, I mean, you can imagine that whenever they hear fireworks going off, you know, they were pretty much distraught and paranoid and everything. And, and so um, it, it's a tough situation. So we continue to do send out uh, notices in this month's and the May uh, billing you should receive uh, it, you notices basically saying no illegal fireworks in all, all the languages. And so uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we can continue to educate the public. I know that there was a gentleman and I'm not sure who it was. Uh, but he came to their council meeting and he basically said, hey, you know what, a lot of, uh, of uh, those individuals who, who are truckers who go to different, these other states where they sell these illegal fireworks, they bring them in and we just need to educate them a little bit more. So we're going to just continue to educate them using our social medias any which way that we can because um, it is a major, major problem. Um, I also wanted to talk about, um, I know that uh, one of our other council members had mentioned about putting a... Um, a notice in the mail as well as in case there was any, because there's day, daytime uh, biting mosquitoes now, <laughs> and they're they're making their way into our neck of the woods. So there's a phone number, there's an email, there's also a website. So if you know of any, and you can report to the uh, uh, the vector control. Um, also, wanted to share um, with council that we're going to. As part of our bargaining group negotiations, we're, going to, we're looking at, we would like to have a special council meeting on Thursday, starting at 6 o'clock, if possible. And um, also, I know that uh, Mayor Pro Tem has talked to me in the, a few occasions about, you know, graffiti along the 99 corridor. And um, we've been, uh, there's, there's two agencies, and I hate to call them out, but it's the truth. Um, you know, the two agencies that I love working with is Caltrans and pg and &E. They're quick. Uh, not really. Okay. It just, it's just, a, a, you know, very difficult to work with them. And we, we try to, um, you know, one of the things that we're great out here is removing graffiti. But unfortunately, there's graffiti along the 99 corridor on this side of the wall. And even where the train actually crosses over, I don't know how those guys actually... Um, cut the fence, jump over, you know, endangering their lives, but they graffiti. So we're working with them, you know, we've, uh, hopefully we can get them to remove that. I know that they uh, cleaned off a section, but there's more graffiti, but we would like to try to discourage these people from painting if we can get it, uh, you know, paint over it the next day, because, you know, we'll see who wins kind of situation, but we're working on it, and thank you for bringing it to my attention, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, 
also wanted to share with council that we haven't received, we've actually advertised for a few months now, and we don't have no representation, no takers on the Measure V uh, committee, citizens committee, uh, so hopefully anybody's interested to, can reach out to us, that would be great. That's all I have for now, thank you. Thank you, Say. Um, council questions, I have a quick question. I know there's come up and the supervisor mentioned a little bit about our uh, transient, um, of people here in our community, oh, yes, yes, obviously, yes. Uh, um, something that we've talked about and coming up with a game plan. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, yes. Let me talk about it. So, uh, again, homelessness is. Somewhere. A, can you, yeah. Can you guys please mute your phone, your device? Thank you. Yeah. So homelessness is, of course, you know, is, is something very, very. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult situation because we want to. Well, on one end, we want to respect their dignity and we want to. You know, do the things right. We don't want to get sued. But we've worked real closely with Caltrans, with the railroad company. We've had, you know, several encampments uh, on this side of town. We've we've seen some along the the uh, on Main Street, right in right in front of Ace. I mean, uh, yeah, Ace True True Value Hardware Store. And so we reached out to, of course, the county. So we have the Merced uh, Rescue Mission and uh, Mr. Metcalf, wonderful resources. As the supervisor alluded to, there is a home that they purchased just outside the city limits. I also reached out to uh, Simleman Gray's office. He connected me to uh, Megan. We have a turn, we have a meeting coming up uh, where we're looking at other resources and trying to figure out a way one of the things that staff has been talking about is that as uh, Turlock and some of these other cities, Modesto, become a little more aggressive in, in trying to address their homelessness, then we have a lot of those who make their way. They don't stay here too long, but even if it's a week, it, it creates some dynamics for us. And, and again, we have to approach it in, in a delicate way, and, and we are aware of it, and thank you for letting us know about you know, these different things that are going on. Because especially if they're um, starting fires, and when I say starting fires, I'm not necessarily saying that they're, um, that more than likely it's cooking or something of that nature. I'm not, I'm not aware of just randomly making fires. But again, it's a health and safety uh, issue, and so we're trying to address it the best we can. And with your help, I'm sure we can do that. So we're working on with that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll talk some more more about those concerns during my my uh, report. Um, Council, any questions for City Manager? Where are you? Council, any questions on the phone? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna move on to. City. Oh, negative. Thank you. We're gonna move on to City Council. You have a question? Oh, go ahead. Um, Mr. Ramirez. Um, yes. A couple of weeks ago, we did have a uh, city-wide cleanup, community cleanup, and we did cover the area that was over there by Winton and B Street. And I know the gentleman was here, I want to say, three council meetings ago, and he spoke on, on an item I, um, about that area over there. But my question for you is, is why aren't we holding him accountable for cleaning up his own area and while we're on the subject of fireworks, when you look at that area, it is truly, truly dry. Yes, Th thank you, uh, Councilwoman Soto. So as it relates to um, abatement, weed abatement, anything, that's, if there's an accumulation of trash and stuff, staff, we do have, uh, uh, um, I'm not sure exactly how many times a, a year, but at least twice a year, if I remember correctly, we work with, Public Works in the fire department and we send out letters to them basically saying that they need to trim, you know, either trees or brushes or if there's um, grassy areas. And then if there's any trash accumulation, we also reach out to them and they are responsible for cleaning up uh, and upkeeping their area. Um, along the Campbell, some of that property used to belong to Caltrans. Now it's, it's my understanding that basically the neighboring property owners are the new owners, and so they need to maintain all of that, and that's private property. And I know that Anthony might want to share a little bit more information on that. Yeah, so at the moment, uh, Public Works is being pretty aggressive right now, and uh, staff does have quite a few abatement letters sent out to uh, business owners and property owners to 
um, start with the abatement process because we do know Fourth of July is coming up and we do have a lot of uh, dry vegetation out there. So I just wanted to inform council. Thank you. Any further questions? Also, on, on the same day, we, we did a, a walk down downtown. Uh, and the question is, the sidewalks there on Main Street, who is, whose responsibility are the sidewalks to, to maintain the areas in front of the businesses? Are you talking specifically about the sidewalks or anything on, above the sidewalks or the trees or the tree wells? Or? Well, I know this well, public works, I've seen public works do those. Okay. The sidewalks so, in front of businesses. Okay, so so the sidewalks is the responsibility of the city. So if there's any gum, if there's uh, you know if it's dirty or if there's any weeds, we address those. The actual tree and the tree wells, we take care of those. There's some trash cans in the downtown area. We also dump those. Uh, anything else uh, that's not related to the items I just mentioned would be the responsibility of the uh, business owner. So let's say that they sometimes they they put out, you know, maybe their own uh, uh, plant or something of that nature. That would be their responsibility. Thank you, sir. Let's move on to city council members' announcements and reports. Council member Jose Moran. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, well, you know, believe it or not, uh, this time around I don't have too many items to report. So. Uh, so like 10 minutes? <laughs> we'll keep it down to a few minutes. Um, you know, just, just, just a couple of things, and, and I want to take the time to uh, say thank you to the uh, police chief and to the exploders for participating um, at the last uh, a couple of um, clinics, vaccine clinics at the middle school on the 23rd and on the 26th. Ralph, I, I think... I wasn't able to count exactly how many exploders were out there, but roughly at least 15 of them every single time. So that that really did a big help uh, to get those uh, vaccine clinics running, and you know everything was perfect. So say, uh, Mr. Chief, uh, if you can say thank you to the exploders and to the officer in charge. Um, and then, uh, as uh, others were mentioning on on. April 24th, we did, or we participated on the citywide cleanup, and um, I was really surprised that um, going downtown, up two blocks up the street, uh, even in the, where the trees are at, in there, there's a lot of trash that it, it either gets stuck in there, and nobody sees, but, you know, if you're like, you know, I was able to see it, and I was able to clean it up. And to what uh, uh, Council Member Soto was mentioning, there were some uh, dried weeds, because there's a couple of areas in between businesses, and it seems like nobody cleans that area in between. And there, you know, so dead grass and dry grass, and you know, so we, we had to pull that ourselves. But I mean, it didn't take that much, but it's just it made the downtown area look a little bit better. Um, and I was wondering, does the garbage or, or the trash? sweeper that goes around the city, does it go to, into downtown or just the residential? Okay, all right. So yeah, maybe it was just those, those, that weekend when we were there, I, we picked up a lot of trash from around the edges on the street right next to the sidewalk. You know, it just, um, I don't know, maybe it's just one of those things, but um, just on, a comment on that. And thank you to everyone that participated for the citywide cleanup we did. Uh, we did about four hours, uh, and we picked up about roughly, I don't know, like eight, ten large trash bags of garbage around the city, and all that was done by volunteers, including the garbage bags. Um, and on October, I'm sorry, April 28, I attended a self-help workshop for the city of Livingston. Um, it seems like, I don't know if we don't have enough residents applying for that, for that program, uh, Mr. Ramirez, but, but, it, but it seems like, uh, um, I don't know, uh, people are not becoming active, engaged, or applying uh, for that program. I, I mean, there's funds out there, and it seems like uh, more people should be taking advantage of that program, you know, either for uh, rental assistance and utilities. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Councilmember Rand, first of all, I want to 
apologize to the public and to the council because uh, self-help uh, is not a new partner for the city, but they have some new staff. And so we've been trying to get them to, you know, basically hold some virtual meetings, some in, in you know, in-person meetings so that we can uh, advertise and engage the public. And so uh, they're working on that and, I, and, and we're pushing them to do that because the yes, like council member Moran is saying, there is a, there's money out there and again, uh, for rental assist, mortgage assistance, there's rental assistance, there's utility assistance, and there's also certain uh, funds out there for individuals that might have uh, different circumstances. Um, and so if the best thing to do is just to either call City Hall or call the self-help number that we have, and, and some of these uh, virtual meetings will be recorded, so that way uh, those who, who want to see it can you know, they repeat it, et cetera. So again, let your neighbors, let your, your friends know there is money available. Thank you for that. Um, and then this last weekend we had uh, something great happening here uh, across the street at the park. At the, uh, I keep on forgetting the name of the park. Court, court Park, right? Okay. Well, well it's, just, it's just that area across the street. It's not a park yet, the grassy area. <laughs> All right, so, so anyways, I was able to participate at the uh, hotspot giveaway, which I think it was very successful. We had a lot of people out there from the community, and it was basically uh, hotspots at no cost, as long as the only thing that you needed to do was to have a child in school, either, either from TK to 12th grade. And that could be renewed every year for up to five years at no cost, access to Wi-Fi. So uh, I'm glad to, to uh, have seen a lot of residents out there that took advantage of this program, and uh, hopefully we will continue to bring um, programs like that uh, for our community. And uh, at the same time, I just wanna say thank you to everyone that participated and made it a successful event. A um, Couple of questions, and then, because I had uh, uh, two businesses actually mention this. Is there anything within regards to the COVID, to COVID funds that could help with uh, business license fees when their license fees are coming up and be due? The, the answer to that is we, we don't know of any specific funding specifically for that. However, there is funding uh, that is available to help the businesses. Um, like for instance, if the business is uh, experiencing also some, you know, can't pay, um, let's just say their utilities. I mean, there is there is some funding out there for that. Again, there is some, they have to qualify for it. But um, if you might recall, some of the American um, Rescue Plan funding that we are actually going to be receiving, in there you'll see small business, you know, economic development, small business development. And so if council so chooses, there's going to be some funding and you guys can actually allocate some, some of that funding to help businesses and we can come up with the criteria and who we can help and how we can help. But, but there's nothing that I know of that specifically targets that. All right, thank you. And I, and I know that I should have asked that when it was your turn, it was, but, but I just had to forgot about it and apologize. And other, other than uh, just the last comment uh, in regards to the concern of uh, uh, not enough housing in Livingston. I think we're very aware of that, and uh, uh, we're, I just want to say that we're working on that, and hopefully we'll have more affordable housing in the city of Livingston. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council Member Maria Soto. Just a couple of things. Last month, I know that uh, these few months we've been doing special um, presentations in regards to an awareness month, but um, we failed to recognize April as being the National Sexual Assault Prevention and Awareness Month. And this is separate from Domestic Violence Awareness Month, which is held in October. So again, um, if we want to bring awareness to some of the, and it's, 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 it's sad, but it does happen. 
Um, but bringing awareness and actually letting everybody know that, that these, these types of actions against women, men, boys, girls, is, is wrong. So um, we failed to recognize that last month, and I just wanted to, to bring it up at, at this time in my report. Um, I did have a question for uh, Chief, though, in regards to that. Um, about how many, I know that it's not, we, we do receive the report and it's on social media in regards to, to reports like DUIs or in either um, maybe alcohol related. How many cases do, does, are any of those related to domestic violence, sexual assault type? To, to give you a correct answer, I'd actually have to go back and look uh, to see the association between DUIs and domestic violence. I know there's some correlation between the two because obviously uh, there's a lot of alcohol involved in domestic violence. So I can actually get that, that answer. Uh, we just have to go and research it and pull up the, uh, the data. I appreciate that, and, and again, October will be coming up as, as the domestic awareness, and, and that'll give you plenty of time to do that research. Okay. Thank you so much. Will do, okay. <laughs> um, May 8th, as uh, Tony mentioned, is the car show. Just to throw this out there, there will also be, if, if those in the audience are in our virtual audience are interested, we are doing on-site registration so that, um, so that if you come out day of, we'll be able to put you and place you out there. Um, we also had to counsel, count, counsel the um, 3K fun run, which we were doing with the Merced County Hispanic Chambers, and it was a little bit uh, disappointed in, in that we had to do that. There was only eight and I'm not too sure if they are residents of Livingston or if it included those from Merced, but we took a, a leap out there and, and wanted to provide this to our community because we want a more active community, uh, activities for our citizens and for our youth because it did involve a youth run as well, and we didn't take advantage of that, and it's... Um, it was really disappointing on, on my part of it to have this whole event canceled in the morning. So again, I, I just want to emphasize that when the community asks for events and wants uh, things available that are healthy, um, fun, recreational, family-oriented, we put them out there. And again, taking advantage of them is, is up to you. It's a choice. But again, I'm not scolding anybody. I don't want to lecture anybody, but I am. But uh, also, uh, May 22nd, VFW is holding their, their annual, well, their bunco. They have it twice a year, and it's a fun event. This is open to the community. That's why I'm, I'm stating this. It's, it's not well advertised, but uh, we try to get the word out there. Bunco is it's real fun. It's, it's a dice game. And then they also are having their May 27th Hamburger Night. We just had one this past Thursday, and it was really successful. So I thank the community for coming out there and supporting our, our local veterans and what uh, they do for our local veterans and their families. One last thing. I do have a question for, for legal. Um, I know that on, we've talked about this in regards to the Brown Act. On social media, we, we get tagged, all of us, in a, uh, a post of some sort, or we get asked questions that are, are related to city business and whatnot. And again, what, what can we do? Because again, we've talked about Brown Act and how it involves three of us, or if we're out there at community events, such as the one that occurred this past week, and, and People are talking about, oh, they're all standing together. Uh, 
you know, maybe it's a photo op and we're not talking business. So again, what, what can we do as, as a council so that we don't have that kind of perception either on social media or out in the public? Absolutely, Councilwoman. Uh, so as council members, you're allowed to attend ceremonial events or other city events in your official capacity. In regards to social media posts, um, it's fine if you're tagged in a post with other council members. Um, what you want to avoid is commenting directly on another council member's post or on a post in which the council member has also posted on. Um, so really the best practice is if someone is, is asking a question of you or making a comment that you want to respond to in which you're tagged with your fellow council members, um, the best practice would be to respond to that individual directly and not and through the, you know, a Facebook uh, a chain of posting and comments. Thank you, Trevor. I just wanted to clear that up because, again, it comes across to public when we have things on social media and we're not commenting and there's a reason why we don't. It's not that we're trying to ignore anybody, but I'm sure that if you want to reach out to us directly, we all have our websites. Our phone numbers have been made available. And if we're not responding on social media, well, you know, we're trying to avoid certain things um, in regards to our elected position. So thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Maria. Council Member Kang, any, any uh, Anything for your report? Nope, I got nothing to report. Uh, Mayor Potem Garcia? No, I'm negative. Okay, we're going to move on to Mayor's announcements and reports. I have a, a couple of things. I um, had a meeting with the Governor's External Affairs um, um, staff last week. He's trying to establish a better relationship uh, at the state level, uh, provide resources in regards to the COVID vaccinations and uh, like the supervisor mentioned earlier, trying to advocate and and have people get vaccinated. Overall, I think the county is very low in, in percentages, so we have to keep keep on pushing. Um, it was a good meeting, and we'll continue having those conversations and relationships with the state. Uh, also, this week we're participating in the MCG One Voice uh, Advocacy Program um, with different agencies, federal agencies. Uh, staff, uh, senators, um, and such. This whole week started today and it goes through the 7th. This year it's a little different. It's not a trip to D.C. It's actually a Zoom program. And um, I want to thank uh, our, our city manager and Maria for also participating in that program. Um, and like I said, it's, it's very, it's very um, informative. We get a lot of resources, a lot of information that we could seek funding and opportunities to better our community. So it's, it's, it's a good program every year. Um, I also want to give a big thank you to uh, Public Works, Anthony, for, uh, and our city manager for um, uh, you know, listening to me and advocating for a new play structure for our Lucero Park. I know we reached out to Public Works, a few citizens, a group of, of, uh, of community members in that area reached out to me and I was able to visit with, uh, with uh, that park and, and see how the, the, the structure out there is, it's, the slide's broken and there's some safety and hazard, um, you know, dangers there and we were able to tape it off. There was a bench also broken. I think the bench has been replaced, correct? Um, so I know that we worked in regards to getting uh, estimates how much it will cost and so I'm going to be advocating to for a replacement um, you know as I mentioned to the people in that community I think it's very important everybody has access to a clean park and a good play structure no matter where what side of town or where in town so I'll, I'll, I'll be advocating and working with staff to get that accomplished as soon as possible because uh, there's a lot of kids over there so a few apartment complexes Surrounding the area, and those kids deserve a play to a place to to play and a slide to slide on and all that good stuff. So I appreciate the the work staff's doing in regards to that. Another item, um, I obviously mentioned self help. Um, I know we I sat down with the city manager and called self help on uh, on one occasion, and my ex I know it was a Zoom meeting and workshop, but my expectation is to just knowing our community is to have it in person because. 
um, you know, it's hard for people to access internet as it is and, um, you know, uh, get in a Zoom meeting. Uh, and the people that need it most, need the most help, it's not gonna go and jump in a Zoom meeting. They don't see it in person. So that's my expectation in regards to self-help. I know we reached out to them and, and we asked them, um, personally asked them to, to conduct a workshop. So uh, let's try to keep on having that contact with them. And, and do in person or even uh, door to door. Like, I don't know, you know, there's different things they could do um, because that funding is available and needs to be used. Uh, another important thing, I've, obviously, we talked about the tax revenue sharing agreement with the county. Um, I've had a few conversations with them. We're scheduling a meeting next week uh, with them to sit down and have that discussion and start those negotiations or at least hear from their side, um, their point of view. And mm -hmm. it's always best to just sit down and communicate with each other, open that, open that line of communication to better understand where each side is coming from. So that'll be very important. Um, just another uh, information, uh, the Livingston Volunteer Fire Company, the Livingston Fire Department's recruiting uh, volunteers. Uh, I don't know if you've seen some signs, some banners throughout the, the community. We put them out um, this weekend. If you have any questions, reach out uh, uh, to the fire station or myself. We could give you some more information. Um, I know there's a national public uh, or a national public works week coming up. Correct, Anthony? Uh, it's on the 16th, correct? To the 22nd. Uh, so I would like to see a, a resolution or a proclamation, uh, just recognizing that. I know we missed the national public safety tele telecommunications week, so I'd like to see one uh, as well. And then um, Council I Member Soto, a sexual assault proclamation, awareness pro proclamation, we'd like to see that as well. Um, we could do that as well. Um, and one last thing in regards to our homeless, um, you know, uh, concerns. Uh, I've been getting a lot of calls regarding, you know, uh, people are in the community. Um, as a social worker for many years, I know it's, it's, uh, it's not a, it's a difficult situation. We have to see it from uh, the multiple, multiple points of views. It's not as simple as people just coming through here and making a mess. It has to do a lot more with um, mental health, substance use, uh, you know, situations that, you know, uh, trauma, whatever the case may be that resulted in them being out on the streets. So if, um, if we're just trying to, you know, give them citation and try to get them out of town, it's not gonna work. We're gonna have to approach it a different way, use our resources, our county resources. I work, you know, uh, obviously work with them on a daily basis. Uh, there's, you know, plenty of resources out there. We need to get mental health involved. Um, like you mentioned, the rescue mission's a good resource. Um, our, our mobile crisis team for mental health is a good resource. Uh, navigation center staff, they're great. Uh, shelters are great. Uh, ultimately, most of the services that are, um, are that population seeking is in, in the bigger city. I know that you come through here um, seeking help or moving along in 99, uh, but we could facilitate help, not only like citing them, like I mentioned, but actually helping them. Um, obviously, I, I mentioned to the city manager this weekend, there was some fires at the old Taco Bell, not a huge fire, but like a warming fire. Um, uh, so besides, you know, obviously going out there, reaching out to them, we, we have to work with the property uh, owner and and also hold them accountable because it's, a, like I said, a multiple um, multiple partnership that has to happen in order for us to address that. I know in the past we've partnered up with Caltrans to clean up some of those um, situations, um, but uh, I, I just commend staff for uh, continued work on that area. And uh, if you need any support from council, I'm sure we will be here. Uh, to facilitate such a uh, such support, and that's it for me. We're going to move on to citizen comments. If I may, yes, go ahead, Mayor. Can I request a like a five minute recess, please, before we get? I mean, there's a lot of citizens in the audience, and I don't want to interrupt anybody. Can I request a five minute recess, please? Sure. Yes. Okay. Perfect. I guess we'll go on a five minute recess.
Minute recess. We're here back under, uh, we're going to talk or move on to citizen comments. The section of the agenda allows members of the public to address the city council and any item not otherwise on the agenda. Members of the public, when recognized by the mayor, should come forward and that identify themselves. Comments are normally limited to three minutes in accordance with state open meeting laws. No action will be taken by the city council this evening. For items which are on the agenda this uh, evening, members of the public will be provided an opportunity to address the city council as each item is brought up for discussion. Do we, get in, do we have any citizen comments at this time? Please step up. We do have one. Welcome, sir. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. Um, let me take my mask off. Uh, my name is Matt Fell, and I'm the Deputy Director of Planning at Merced County Association of Governments, uh, MCAG. And I'm here just to let you know that we have our Measure B annual report out, and that's this document, and it's in English and Spanish. Um, and this is something, this is our third annual report, and the purpose of this is to let the community know about all the great things that Livingston and the other cities and county have been doing with Measure B. So Measure B is the half cent sales tax for transportation that the Merced County voters passed in 2016. Um, so far, almost $70 million has been collected from this half cent sales tax, and it's going out to these projects that you can see in this report. So a lot of road paving, a lot of sidewalks, I know ADA ramps have been done in Livingston, um, some bridges have been repaired, and additionally over 160,000 free bus trips for seniors, veterans, and ADA eligible passengers on the bus system have been funded by Measure B. Um, so this report is available on our website at mcgov.org slash on the move, and you can get it English, Spanish, you can also see an interactive map of all the projects and you can see everything throughout the county that's been done. So just wanted to let you know that Measure V is doing exactly what the voters um, were promised and we look forward to that continuing for another 26 years. Uh, with that, thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you, sir. Um, the actual copies of the report, um, yeah. I, could you guys provide the city of Livingston like a, yeah. a, a good amount of them just to have available? Sure. Like at City Hall and sure. in any other community events? Please. Yeah, yeah. We will. I will have some hard copies sent your way. Thank you. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Council, do you guys have any questions? No questions. Thank you so much. Thank All you right. for taking the time coming down. Thank you. Any other citizen comments? Yes, Jason Ross, 1629 Spruce Court. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just curious about the lighting at Delta Gala Park. When is that going to happen? Thank you, sir, for the comment. Uh, we have Anthony coming up. Oh, I'm sorry, Anthony. Sorry, I have. Hello, Mr. Roth. This is uh, Anthony Polar Works, director. Uh, we currently uh, solicited for bids. Um, we will. We put it on the schedule and waiting for a call back from the contractor, but we're anticipating within about two weeks we should have one of um, one of the sites up, and that is going to be at uh, the well site, illuminating the area um, I identified in a previous council meeting. That is going to be like where the uh, uh, back of the well site is, well 13, uh, illuminating the, the uh, walk path area there. And also by the uh, playground area, and then we're working on the uh, opposite corner where the storm lift station is on the parking lot side. Parking lot side. So once we get those two up and illuminated, and we'll see where else we need to uh, better illuminate that walk path. Uh, that dip that goes down, uh, that is the worst spot. Uh, we're, we're at again, sir. Okay, so as you're walking down past the well, when you get down by those homes there and then start going up by the playground, that's okay. where the lighting is not very good at all. Okay, no, thank you for pointing that out. Thank you very much. Thank you, I think. Thank you. Anybody else on the phone? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. 
Are you ready for Hi, the talk? Hi, it's uh, Stephen Singh from 789 Almond Glen. Uh, uh -huh. My question to the city council is, what are they going to be doing about all these tire theft that's been going on to the Toyota Camry in Livingston? Uh, the what again? Can you repeat your, your statement? Yeah, sir, yeah, there's been a lot of Toyota Camrys that have been getting their tires stolen. Yeah. It's a, the police chief, it's the Camrys. I think you're talking about the Camrys, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Chief, you want to make a comment on that, what your force has been doing? Did I hear that right? Tires? They're still in tires? Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> um, yeah, we do everything we can. Um, every time we get uh, any type of, well, any type of crime that we start seeing a trend. Uh, one of the biggest things that been going on was the catalytic converters that kind of slowed down for a while. Uh, we try to beef up patrols as much as possible um, in those general areas that we are having the issues. Um, unfortunately, we go to one area, it goes somewhere else, uh, but we do as much as possible. We try to engage the citizens as much as possible to start calling us when they actually start seeing people out there that look suspicious. You do not have to give a name. I know that's probably one of the biggest things that I've run in, in all the time that I've been here at the Livingston Police Department was people don't want to get involved. If you don't want to leave your name, you don't want us contacting you, just at least call us if you see somebody out there in the street and they just they just look suspicious. That doesn't mean that we're going to go out there, we're going to arrest anybody, but at least it'll, it'll take us to the general area and we can contact these individuals and see what they're doing. But it comes down to, and I've always said it, is the... Uh, is the public. Uh, that's, the, that's the number one thing. They have to get involved. Um, I'm not saying that, we're, that we can't do certain things, but you know, when there's only a few of us on, and if, if we're busy doing something else, or we've, you know, there's a lot of things that we do, um, that helps when people give us a call. And that's probably one of the number one things that we don't get a lot of. Uh, and that we have to start getting people involved, <clears throat> excuse me, when they actually see things out there. And, and it doesn't necessarily, again, mean that, that somebody's doing something. Just call us. Hey, just, it just doesn't look right. Hey, there's somebody out there. They're, they're walking around. They've walked back and forth for the last, you know, 20 minutes. They don't look like they belong here. And then let us handle it from there. That's how things are. We, we stop things from happening. Um, but 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 I want people to get involved and start giving us a call and 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 quite often that doesn't happen. Yeah, I just think it's wild because I've ne I've lived here for forty years and I've never had like I've never heard that happening in like our city. So I mean, maybe I I feel like we should probably start hiring more cops if there's a, such a low limitation of you know a catch of catching out all these thefts. Yeah, that's, that's a, like, again, it's a trend that's going on right now. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw that, but that was going on within the last, I think it was probably about four or five months ago, a lot of smash and grabs. And then we had found out that uh, this was a crew that came into our town uh, from the Bay Area that would just happen to be driving through and started doing those things to the to some of the local businesses that were busting in. And, and it, they're just things that, that go on. And, and again, you'll get a, a group of individuals. They'll be driving around. They'll attack one town, and they'll start going. In. Like Just like I said, it was, I'd have to say, maybe two months ago, the catalytic converters, we were just having them taken left and right. Uh, well, actually, the police department had one taken uh, from our vans out in the parking lot. Uh, I mean, and we were a victim of it as well. So um, That's just bad. Yeah. So, but I I stress and and I and I've always said it. it. People have to start getting involved, and they have to call us. And again, this does not mean we're going to start going out and harassing people, things like that. But if you start seeing things suspicious, no matter how little it is, give us a call, please. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Anybody else on the phone? Yes, I, I'm on the phone. Do you have a citizen? Hello, my name is Lori Chavez. I don't live in, out in um, Livingston, but I do live in Atwater, and I run a program, a spade and neuter program. 
Uh, and that, ma'am, uh, that I'm items, to go I'm trying to turn off. Anyway, uh, the um, items coming up for discussion. I wanted to tell yeah. you about how important it is for the spay and neuter. I know you all are Hello? having an issue with it. Can you hear me? Uh, can you, uh, we're, that item's not up for discussion yet. Right now, we're just doing uh, general citizen comments. The item's going to be coming up for discussion, and you'll have an opportunity uh, oh, okay. to say your piece. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Good evening. I'm Margarita Aguilar, PO Box 743. I just had a little comment. Um, I know that they've had great um, suggestions on how I noticed the departments come up, the head of departments come up, and they share what's going on in the department. I did not hear from all the departments. And uh, being a citizen of uh, Livingston, I know that uh, the council has changed. Uh, lots of things have been happening and changing in our community. And I think one of the main uh, things we should consider is that our citizens need to know how the departments are, are functioning, what's, their, what's their, uh, their goal. And so I'm asking Jose if maybe starting in June, the first two meetings in June and July, you could, uh, we could kind of get together if we can and uh, have every head of department come on in and let the public know um, how they're... Um, just a simple 15, 20 minute presentation. What's going on in the department? Um, you know, how many people are within the department? What are their goals? What are their future expectations? How we as citizens can come and get involved uh, when it comes to making decisions on some of these departments. Um, one of the main concerns that I brought to my attention is uh, if we could start with the PD, police department, being that uh, we're gonna have a couple of changes in the near future. But I think the most important is, uh, I heard questions from citizens about certain things that are happening in our city. So I think that, and even Council Member Soto asked the question that wasn't able to be answered. I think that if it's like uh, every two weeks or once a month, when PD especially and fire department could come in and give uh, uh, an overview of what's going on. That way citizens know where they need to go if there's something that they need to report. And it's kind of like an open door where they feel confident enough to speak to someone and not feel you know, targeted for any particular reason. So I was hoping we could get together on that, Jose, and bring it forward so that the citizens are being uh, more aware of what each department is. And also think about the budget, You know, talk about the budget um, so that they have a, a knowledge of uh, how each department is allocated certain monies and how they're being used and uh, just really inform the, the citizens. And then um, I just wanted to just make a comment in regards to Council Mango Soto. You made a, a comment in regards to uh, the participation in one of the runs that, that uh, uh, citizens uh, did not all show up. And uh, right now, I know all of us, most of us are wearing masks. I noticed you don't have one, but regardless, um, not everyone is feeling comfortable right now. We, we're still in the pandemic. Our, our state minutes. and our community is uh, still struggling among the country. So, you know, it's just, they're just being careful, okay? Um, I work at a school where we still have our students keeping the distance. They're wearing a mask all day, inside and out, and so is staff. So it's not that they don't want to, it's that they're just doing what's best for them at the time. And I hope that in the future, as time goes on, we could be part of those um, events. And you could be, you know, all of us could be part of it. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you, you Ms. Aguilar, for that comment and again. Um, I'm sorry if I, well, I, I did mention that. And again, it was just, just the outreach part. Maybe there's a lot of factors involved in that. Maybe we didn't reach all the masses throughout the county because it was a, a, a county event. But Livingston was part of the host. And again, not getting any of... Uh, feedback from our citizens, and I realize the, the cautionary uh, things that, that, that our citizens are doing and every, you know, throughout the nation, throughout the world. Uh, so again, we're going to try again, uh, perhaps when things lighten up a little bit more, and uh, again, we're going to reach out to the community perhaps in the fall. So again, there's going to be the, another opportunity for our, our citizens to come out and support an event like this. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. And, and then just a little, um, a little bit of information about the reason uh, we've been uh, limiting uh, department heads coming into the meetings due to COVID. So we kind of staggered um, departments in regards to their reports and being present. But my expectation's always been that we want to hear from all the, all the departments, uh, but being considerate of the whole COVID situation as well. 
Um, th so thank you for your comments. Let's move on to the consent agenda. agenda. Items on the consent agenda are considered routine or non-controversial and will be enacted by one vote unless separate action is requested by the city manager or city council member. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless members of the city council or city manager request that specific items be removed. I move to uh, approve the consent agenda as presented. We have a motion by Council Member Jose Moran. Do we have a second? I'm, I'm sorry, there is, there's a motion, but uh, I, I had a few, maybe a, I don't want to remove the item, um, but it was presented at, at uh, the Rec Commission. But there was a few things that I had wanted to also add or, or ask. You want to pull it out and so you can have a separate discussion with it? Well, no, we're running into to deadlines, but again, this might. Maybe you want to ask questions specifically to the item, you could pull it out and then you could, we could talk about it. At a later time or right now? No, no, right now. And then approve it? Perfect. We, we could, we could um, pass the consent agenda with the rest of the items and then talk about your items separately. And then pass it. Yeah. Motion. Yeah, that's fine. Which item are you talking about? Number six. Okay, we'll uh, move. Um, mayor, this is for the mayor pro tem. Yes? Is that even possible since we already started our meeting and at the beginning, didn't you announce that if there's any changes to the agenda, uh, probably something for legal. Yeah, Trevor, you have any comments on this? Yeah, it's permissible to pull an item from the consent agenda if the Council Member Soto has questions she'd like answered. Okay, so we could pull it out, right? Correct. Okay, so we'll pull, pull up item number six, and then so the rest of the we have a motion for the rest of the consent agenda. We have a second. I'll second. I'll okay. second. We have a second by Councilwoman Maria Soto. We get roll call, please, Monica. Roll call, Council Member Soto. Yes. Council Member Moran. Yes. Council Member King. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garcia. Yes. Mayor Aguilar. Yes. Motion approved by a vote of five zero. Okay, then we'll talk about item number six. What specific questions do you have about it? Thank you, Tony. Thanks. Um, for item number six, we do have a safe and sane fireworks sampler show. I was just wondering, we only have one sponsor agency. However, we do have a TNT that is also represented in our and the community for the safe and sane, is there a reason why we only have one sponsor invited or have we reached out to them? Actually, it was Phantom Fireworks that approached us probably seven years ago and uh, offered to do it. Okay. TNT has never offered. Okay. So that's the only reason it's been Phantom Fireworks and they reach out to us every year, say, hey, we'd like to do this again. And we used to do it at our downtown market. So um, we would set that up and let them have it. Uh, TNT has the same opportunity. They've just never reached out and never asked. Is there still time to reach out? Uh, no, because now it's so before it's you guys. Okay. Okay. So, but for next year, if they would like to do it, um, because I used to do the fireworks booth for youth football, um, they would always do a display, but they've never done one for the city before. Um, and that's- hey, please, sorry, sorry. Can you guys please mute your phone or device? Can you guys please mute your phone? <laughs> so, sorry, lost my train of thought. But we, um, we take anybody who would like to give something and provide for the community. Everybody's welcome. We do talk to TNT uh, at least three times before the 4th of July, and they've never mentioned that they would like to do it, but we're not opposed. Also, um, on these I know, because I do a lot of work with the, the veterans, mm -hmm. on here I, I'm not too sure how we, well we do collaborate well with them, but it also is the May 30th and November 11th are also community events. 
So when so we do our, when we do this agenda, I'm sorry. Did you want to say something? No, else? I was just I was just asking as to why you know if 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 it's something that that we have to organize through the city through through either recommission or. Um, well, actually, before we even set this agenda, the first thing we do is we reach out to each organization, including the VFW. They give us all their dates, uh, including the Banco, which for the last 10 years I have not missed except once for in Hawaii, which I absolutely love. I think everybody should go. <laughs> so, um, but we reach out to each organization. They submit their dates. We also submit it through, we get the high school, VFW, the churches, um, any organization that has something going on in Livingston, we reach out to them before we set this, um, our calendar for the year. And if you notice, if you go back probably the last five to seven years, Jackie has been putting that together regularly, ex except for during COVID time, everything was canceled. But we do that, we start in probably November, December before the next year, and everybody submits their dates. And then we go ahead and do our events around everybody else's schedule, not to conflict, but to support. Did you have any other questions about that? No, I'll, I'll just reach out to uh, Dennis and Sue Wells. Thank you. Yes, and we did get Dennis's information, and we have been putting the hamburger night out there as well to help get them supported. And um, if you look on our rec page, we've also are shared the bunco. And during the parade as well, because, you know, there's a few things that I feel very passionately about, and so that's a few of them. But yes, so if there's anything else the VFW would need, they can always give us a call. They do have my email as well, the Women's Auxiliary, and they're more than welcome to send me anything else they might need. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay. Any other questions on any of the events? Okay. No. No further questions. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate it. Any motions by council? Uh, take, I'll make the motion. We have a motion by Mayor Pratem Garcia. I'll second. Second by Councilwoman Maria Soto. Can we get roll call, please? Roll call, Councilmember Soto? Yes. Councilmember Moran? Yes. Councilmember King? Yes. Mayor Pratem Garcia? Uh, yes. Mayor Aguilar? Yes. Motion approved by a vote of 5-0. Thank you, Monica. We're going to move on to discussion of potential action items. The first item up is number seven, which is discussion and direction on pop-up events and procedures. And this is Tony is coming up. Getting in on my steps tonight. <laughs> okay. So really quick, I wanted to um, address a couple of things that you guys had talked about, just so you know that we are being a little proactive on some of the things. For the Women's Awareness Week, we've actually already met with, it's called Kav Maga. It's about women's empowerment and self-defense. And so uh, they also do men's self-defense, but when we met with them, they were more into the women's side of it. And so we have reached out, um, we're going, it's for 16 and older. So we're going to target women. I know that before I went to college, my mom made me take a self-defense class because I was going to the Bay Area. So one of the things that um, they do is teach young ladies this, um, not to hurt, but to defend and remove themselves from danger. So we are already in the meetings with them about bringing a class to Livingston and potentially trying to target the high school as well because it's 16 and older. So we have reached out to Mr. Jolly, but with the COVID restrictions, it's slowing down that process a little bit. But when it does open back up, we are definitely going to be doing that. So, and about the run. So, um, I'm sorry, I didn't know that much about it, but we, as the Red Commission, know that we do a color run every year. And it's been very successful. We do have guidelines set up for COVID and social distancing and that kind of thing. So, if the Hispanic Chamber would like to maybe reach out to our rec commission to collaborate with us on that. Um, we had talked about moving it to the fall, is that right, Linda? To the fall, to where um, hopefully people are more vaccinated, which Linda does, so be careful, she will get you, and uh, vaccinate you before you leave the building. 
Hey, Tony, so, so were you going to address the... Uh, the pop-up? Pop yes. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew that we were addressing some of the things, some of your concerns. Okay. So now on to the agenda item. So the recommendation, uh, staff recommends that the City Council review the Livingston Park Recreation and Arts Commission recommendations for the pop-up special events on city property and provide feedback and direction. Some of the background, on April 6th of 2021, the mayor and council asked staff to bring a recommendation regarding pop-up events in Livingston. Because the commission meets on the fourth Thursday of the month, they were not able to review the item until April 22nd. There were three or four pop-up promoters in attendance, and we were able to provide, they were able to provide feedback and input into the discussion. So a fee, a deposit, and, a, and an agreement was discussed and presented to you tonight for consideration, if approved. Staff will present the fees in a separate item for approval and adoption. All promoters were invited to attend the council meeting to give further input for the council. The discussion uh, from the Parks, Recreation, and Arts Commission is supportive of the pop-up events being held throughout the city. In order to maximize the use of city premises and provide a fair and reasonable process that the Commission has drafted a series of recommendations the city council, for the City Council's consideration. Any fees proposed by the Commission will be presented to City Council at a separate meeting for approval and adoption. In summary, the Commission unanimously voted to present the following proposals to the City Council on approving the pop-up of special events. First, promoter must have a City of Livingston business license. This fee is subject to change, but the current fee is $64. Second, the promoter must carry insurance policy at the limits established, naming the city as additionally insured. Current requirement is $1 million. Third, if food vendors will participate in the event, promoter must have a Merced County Health Department community event permit, and all of their food vendors must be properly permitted. Four, the promoter is responsible for setup, cleanup, closing, and reopening the streets. Fifth, the promoter is responsible for making sure their vendors follow city and county guidelines. Sixth, proposed fees subject to council approved at a future meeting. The first proposed is a three-month agreement. Up to three events within three months period and will pay $200 per event and maintain a $250 security cleanup deposit. The second option is a one-time event. Proposed fee is $500 per event and a $250 security cleanup deposit. Vendors will, be, will take out their trash with them when the event is over and the promoter may dump the public trash into the dumpsters behind City Hall. The eighth, a packet will be given to the applicants to complete with detailed instructions and meetings to staff. The ninth, final, is recommendation for a once-a-week event maximum between all promoters. If there is one on Saturday, there will not be one on Sunday. So the fiscal impact fees associated with the commission's recommendation are subject to city council's approval and adoption. A separate report will be brought to city council to approve any recommended fees. And you guys did get the application process in your packets if you have any questions about that. Thank you, any Tony. questions? Thank you, Tony. I'll bring it back to council for any uh, questions or comments. Jose Ramirez, do you have additional information? I was just going to ask legal if, if if staff was to bring this to a special meeting. Let's just say, uh, could we could council adopt the resolution uh, adopting these fees? Trevor, are you there? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I got disconnected. Um, the city manager has a question. Could you repeat your question, please? Sure. Yeah, Trevor, if staff was to uh, ask the council by resolution to uh, pass these recommended fees at a special council meeting, there's nothing that would preclude us from doing that, correct? Correct. All right, thank you. Thank you. Council questions, comments, clarifications? On your um, application, the preliminary special event questionnaire? Yes. There is the question, I've seen it before, 
Will you expect city staff assistance? So again, is that something that if city staff were to be utilized, who is paying for that time? Usually if there's an event, it will come out of our department and what we do is we kind of, um, because all overtime has to be approved, that we usually shift in. It's usually Jackie or myself. We either volunteer our time to go out to help with these events to make them successful or then we just shift our hours. We'll come in later to stay later. We come in earlier and we go home earlier. So there is no fiscal impact. That's why we've asked them to open and close their own streets like we've done for the street fair in the past. Um, they've opened and closed their own streets, so we do not get into somebody else's budget. And I was just going to mention the expectation is that these promoters and uh, organizers will do, will, will not need any staff. Correct. No, I, I don't believe so. I've gone out and I've seen Juan and a few, um, some of these just to get an idea of what it's going on and that's where we've accumulated some of our information from and we've talked to them and it's a nice bunch of people. A lot of them are local people and so we're very, in fact our commission is here tonight, they were very enthusiastic about this project. We just need to make sure as a city and as a governing body that we do our due diligence to make sure everything is covered. Thank you, Tony. In regards to myself, um, obviously something I advocated for and met with some of uh, these organizers are interested in organizing such events, and they've been doing it for some time, uh, not necessarily inside the city limits. Um, I think it's great supporting local businesses, uh, you know, starting up um, crafts and all that good stuff. It's, it's very important that we support such such uh, activities. Um, I think it'll be good for the city for another uh, activity to be out there in the community. Um, and then hopefully maybe one day this business, certain business will get a storefront. I know we have several vacant uh, lots out there and maybe they could, we could help them with uh, business license, all that good stuff um, and get it going. Uh, it could be a, uh, a replacement for our farmer's market because I know it wasn't doing so good for some time. and. And this, I think this will be be great, and like you mentioned, a lot of people are from here from town, um, so it's good to support them. Um, the only other, a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, in regards to the deposit on on six, uh, oh, is that something that's going to be refunded? Correct, like the security. Thing? Yes. Yes. What we do um, for organizations is, if like let's say for instance, soccer club comes in, we hold their deposit until they ask us for it back. It would be the same for the promoters. Uh, we would hold it if they renew their contract after three months and like to do an additional three months, then we would hold on to that deposit. If they decide they no longer are interested, then we would refund that deposit. Thank you. Uh, another question, too, and others brought up by fire. I know that in certain events such as these, it requires, you know, like a fire inspection or, or somebody going out there and taking a look at that. Have we considered or how, how's We've been before, like in the farmer's market, do we get any fire inspectors out there or somebody looking at it? No, not the fire department. It's the health department. Oh, right, okay. this, this is where, um, where I have been out there supposed to display a certificate from the health department. And at most of the events we do, I do work with the health department. Right now, they, because they've been closed down for COVID, um, they don't have a lot of guidelines on this yet. And so... But as a city, we have, you have to have the event, just like we do. When we do a large event, 4th of July or Sweet Potato Festival, we are the event promoter. I turn in all that paperwork and then there's a fee that has to be paid or you have your annual fee, we have to have a copy of that. So it'll work the same for this kind of promoter. They'll have to have their own um, event coordinator and basically turn everything in the health department. Thank you. Uh, the only other question I have is the, in regards to the one-time event. I know it's higher than the, the other uh, fees, that, um, the three-month agreement. Um, just, I understand the reasoning behind it, uh, but I know, like, for example, if somebody's wanting to do one event in good faith to help the community or promote uh, local businesses, it's, you know, it's kind of like punishing them, higher fee kind of thing. I know the I know the arguments I was there during the recreation commission meeting. <laughs> right, right. But uh, well, I hope you don't see you know, it as a punishment, but uh, you know um, what I mean, but it's But of like course some, that would be yeah. something you all can discuss. Uh, we like the longevity of it. Mm -hmm. um, anybody who has a commitment tends to want to pay for that and they're willing to stay. Mm -hmm. Then we can count on them. 
Um, because we deal with a lot of last minute in our department, it makes it, the struggle hard. And so dealing with the health department, they do not do last minute. So if they're gonna have, and a lot of these um, pop-ups have food, so it would be hard to have a one-time event and not have food and other refreshments. And then they want to um, ask us to forgive them for having it out, and we can't do that. So if we have something with three months, it would be worth the promoter's time, the fees these people have to pay, because anytime you do something with the health department, it is not easy, nor is it cheap. So usually you get a yearly permit, or you get a special one-time event. If you get the yearly event, it is cheaper than getting the one-time event. So that is um, another reason I think, well, you were there, to kind of get people to come out and make it a long time lasting thing. And th th I think that's really our goal. I don't really know the Red Commission might have a little bit more to say on that from the meeting. Uh, but like I said, you were there. Yeah, but was there. that was kind of the gist of it. Sounds good. Any other comments or questions, Council, at this time? When we're speaking about um, uh, COVID and all the discussion about vaccinations and mask wearing, what are, is, is this, are, are we starting this supposedly this summer or when, 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 are, when is expectation to start? Well, it depends on your guys' recommendation and your consent to it and the fee approval. Then, of course, we will start meeting with the promoters. But anytime you do that, you need, anytime you do any kind of promotion, you need at least eight weeks for good promotion. And somebody needs to see something seven times before it sticks. I have learned that, and anybody who has worked with me on an event, people, they are shaking their head because they get it. Um, people are busy. You need to see it seven times. That's why on our, on our Facebook page, you'll see me keep posting it, posting it, posting it, posting it. Um, but again, uh, we'll, we'll go off your recommendation on what you guys would like us to do. But I know the promoters are ready. I know that I've spoken to a few of them about the business license, the insurance, how to obtain it. And so we want them to be successful. We want them to come back. We want them to spend, we want Livingston to stay within Livingston and support each other. So we would like this to be successful and we're going to do what we can. So whatever you guys decide, we will abide by. But we would like to try, of course, during the summer, it is horribly hot. Nobody comes out until after 6 o'clock. So I don't know how they would feel about that. They've been doing some night events. They've switched it from mornings to nights. So again, we would kind of come back to you guys and visit that for direction. Thank you. Any other questions, Council? Um, actually, not a question, but just more of a comment. I was, that was a very interesting meeting um, discussion. <laughs> um, and, and I think it's something great for the community and, and also for the promoters and for the other participants that want to participate in this event. And, you know, I think I, I'm happy with what I see personally. Uh, and it does make sense because in regards to the, to the one-time fee, one event fee, I think it makes sense because also part of the part of the information provided by the promoters was that they already pay that amount for the events that they're doing now. So, right. and I think it's you know it's not increasing, but it's just staying the same. Mm -hmm. So, and, and and then again, uh, that is only my point of view, and and I think that as we move on forward with something like this, there's going to be some curves, and and you know we just need to be ready to. Uh, you know, adjust and, and kind of uh, try to move forward and, and do what's best for everyone involved. And um, yes. that's it. Thank you. Um, Marie, did I answer your question fully? Because you look, still looked a little confused. <laughs> no, I'm not confused. I, okay. I, 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 was just, I was wondering when it was going to take place and, and if our promoters are, I, I'm not too sure. I've never been to a pop-up event. I don't know what it looks like. Um, but... Just like just it sounds, pop up. Literally, pop up. Pop but this is an organized. They're not just popping up. They've actually registered with you and did all their paperwork. So it's Correct. not there. It's, it's an organized pop up. Correct. Um, but no, if it were to begin soon again, I was just wondering because 
we, we've had it mentioned several times that you know the reasons for these events and people staying away is you know the how how our promoters are also going to mitigate the the whole COVID. If, I if can't that answer that for you since I've gone to a couple of them. At each of their entrances and around all of the pop-ups have hand sanitizer. Everybody is required to wear a mask. It is stated when you enter. And also when um, as soon as you get there, they have hand sanitizer there as well. They're very conscious of this. They are distanced out. And the pop-up isn't meant to be a hangout. You basically go, you do a shop around. Everything's, uh, a lot of them have Venmo. So there is no cash interaction uh, for, I would say, a good 90%. Juan, you were out there. I mean, did you see, I didn't see yeah. a lot of cash transactions. Everybody was using Venmo or Cash App. That is correct. Um, you know, obviously, uh, it's it's following the CDC requirements or regulations, precautions, uh, the entrance, and I think each pop-up also has its own hand sanitizer mm -hmm. and the expectation requirements to wear a face covering um, throughout. But you, like you mentioned, you know, a lot of hands-free or cash-free uh, transactions happening. So um, obviously, we saw each other in one, one event, and we were checking it out, and uh, it seemed to be going well, that there wasn't anybody crowded up and eat, you know individual pop-ups or anything like that it was flowing well uh, it's going to be in an open area uh, you know so it's going to be um, I think it'll be safe um, with all the uh, safety precautions in place yes and those were some of the things that we wanted to address uh, knowing the how we where we are in this day and age so those were some of the things we did look at when I went out um, I did a little shopping myself just to interact, and of course I saw quite a few people from Livingston, which I was very excited about, uh, but I did look at each booth individually to see how the interaction went, their due diligence, and uh, what they could, how it was going to go and flow as far as safety, interaction. Um, everybody was wearing face coverings, everybody kept their distance, like I said, and lots of sanitizer. So I, I felt like I, I was not in fear. I did not think anybody was throwing caution to the wind. Um, they did take it very seriously. And they had um, the signs up. And they recommended all the safety guidelines. So I was feeling very confident that they will continue with that working with the city. Definitely. Thank you. I'm going to take also, it out for, go ahead. Just a comment. Sure. Um, I picked this up. I don't know if you got a copy of it. It's the Women um, Entrepreneur Summer Cohort. So, and it it helps with the small businesses because, again, we want to support our small businesses. But this allows for the small, you know, giving them the opportunity at a, a pop up event, but um, actually going out there, getting licensed, um, you know, possibly going into a, a, a business rather than just a, you know, a pop-up, just actually you know, owning your own business. You already you know, owning it, but actually being part of Livingston downtown, you know, hopefully we're seeing some of that that, uh, you know. Welcome to Verizon Wireless. The wireless customer you called is not yes, available at this phone. time. Please try yep. your call again your later. Device. Announcement one, please. switch two, two, eight, dash two. I'm sorry, Maria, I have not seen Welcome that. Welcome to Verizon Wireless. The wireless customer you called is yes, not available at this time. Please try your, your call device. again later. Announcement one, switch two, two, eight, dash two. But if you'd like to email it to us, we can share it. Uh, we do get a lot of calls from vendors and other um, pop-up people and organizations. So if we have it ready-made, then I can always include it in an email and a packet going out to them. So it would give them something, maybe an incentive to bring their brick and mortar store to Livingston. So this cohort actually starts on May 11th. So if you'd like to take the copy now and make copies for those that are interested, oh, of course. I'm glad to give it to you. And also um, as part of the Hispanic chamber, um, you know, it, it's countywide. So, um, the businesses that are out there, there is assistance for helping to to help you get these licenses and, and just you just have to reach out. And again, I, I could be a contact person or you can also visit their website, Merced County Hispanic Chambers. 
Thank you. We'll take it out, out, out for public comment regarding this item. Anybody, any public comment regarding this item at this time? Hey, Juan, this is Gaudi Deep. I got a question. Go ahead. Hey, did, did you talk about a location where they're going to hold this event or just so inside it? Location. Well, what we discussed at the Rec Commission would, because we've already had the downtown established with the with our downtown street fair and with our farmer's market, people are familiar with that. And one of the things they'd asked was to use the downtown um, because it is local to all our residents and it's within walking distance and it's easy to close off the streets. And everybody downtown is usually supportive of that. It really helps bring people to our downtown. Thank so I'm, I'm not sure if um, Mayor Pro Tem Garcia has ever attended um, the farmer's market or one of our events downtown uh, when we had those going on before COVID to, I can explain it to him or I can email it to him to give him a better idea. Mayor uh, By that, I have uh, attended. Thank well, you, Tony. That was me and Gag that question. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Gag, sorry. I could email it to you too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any public comments? Further public comments? Any any of the organizers want to say anything or no? Okay. Well. You want to come up, please, and state your name, please. Hello, my name is Adriana Maciel, and uh, my daughter is the one doing the pop-ups. Um, now, we have a license for the Merced County because we live outside in Livingston. So we, would we need to get a business license, but what address would we need to put for the business license? Because we have the business license, but it's uh, out in Livingston because it's on Eucalyptus. So for the pop-ups, I know that we're requesting that um, permit, or would I be able to use mine, the one that I have for my um, beauty shop, or how is that gonna work? Tony, Yeah, very simple. You, your, your home address or whatever, wherever your business address is, mm -hmm. that's the address that you use. The, the business license, all it does is it applies that, that you are allowed to do business in, within the city limits. So your address can be any address. Yeah, because it has the Merced County, yeah. uh, but it has the Livingston address. So I would have to get one for here for the city then? Okay, that's it. Thank you. I'll bring it back. Any further questions or comments from the public? Bring it back to council for any further clarifications or direction. So today you're just seeking direction in regards to approving the recommendations, correct? That is correct. And, and bring back to council f a resolution with the actual fees so that you guys can adopt it. Yes. Perfect. Does anybody want to make a motion? I'll make a motion to um, move forward with the next step to make this happen. We have a motion by council member Jose Moran. Do we get a second? I'll second it. I'll second. We have a second by Councilmember uh, Gangadeep Kang. Thank you. We get roll call, please, roll Monica. Call. Roll call. Councilmember Soto. Yes. Councilmember Moran. Yes. Councilmember King. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garcia. Yes. Mayor Aguilar. Yes. Motion approved by a vote of five zero. Thank you, Monica. We're moving on to item number ten. Thank you, correct? Council and Mayor. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks for everybody um, supporting this uh, event and the organizers presently here in the chambers. Um, uh, item number 10, discussion direction on the possibility of installing the speed bumps in residential areas. Yes, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, we actually did, uh, as part of the, uh, a discussion that was had here at the council meeting, went ahead and I provided uh, a copy of just a sample detail of, of what a speed bump, speed bump can look like. Uh, sp speed bumps is one of those um, items that's kind of controversial. You really have folks on both sides of the spectrum. You love them or you hate them. And so we did, staff did some research and it really comes down to how council wants to uh, uh, adopt some type of uh, 
speed bump or um, let's just say uh, there, there's a there's a fancy name that uh, um, no it's uh, it's something related to um, softening um, you know uh, speed bump measures yeah, yeah something like that yeah there you go traffic calming that's what it is it's a fancy little name there but uh, let me just give you some some samples of what other cities are doing some cities will actually uh, budget a certain a, do, a certain dollar amount each year. Let's just say ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a year, and then they have an actual um, criteria and specifications of how to go about with the speed bumps and where and how the speed bumps should be implemented. And then other communities, what they're doing is they're actually having the 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 residents in that corridor or wherever they want the speed bumps they pay for it and what they do is they actually put together some type of of a petition and they'll have an organized individual in that neighborhood kind of get all the signatures and then those there'll be a, a cost uh, that that is going to be defined and based on that cost then all of those individuals in that area would basically partake in the cost and uh, so really the council can go I any direction uh, can do a hybrid of both if they if, if council so chooses but the one of the most important aspects is making sure that the speed bump meets uh, you know certain specifications because the city can receive claims um, if a vehicle if it's not done to a certain engineering standard you know the the Cadillac converter and the muffler and everything else would be in somebody's yard so we don't want that. So uh, again, um, we're more than happy to uh, bring something more formal to council. Um, you know, again, it's not difficult at all. It's just a matter of whether you want to do a hybrid of the two that I mentioned, or go with one where uh, the, the the city basically allocates funding that's limited, of course, to address uh, curbs, gutters, sidewalks, streets, and divert some of that money to address some of the speed bumps or uh, look at the community uh, um, or the neighborhood where they want speed bumps. And again, it's not like you need a lot of speed bumps, but uh, there is a cost associated with that. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna speak a little bit more about it. Um, I, this is something that i um, obviously advocating for and brought it up during the last meeting. After a, uh, you know, numerous um, of our community members approaching us with those concerns. It's been going on for some time now. A lot of, you know, a lot of cars speeding through, uh, you know, our residential areas, which is a big concern. Um, I mentioned also as a firefighter, I've seen it firsthand, the, the consequences of, of those actions and, and the, you know, all the bad stuff that could happen. So I think this is a very important matter. Obviously, uh, speed bumps alone aren't gonna solve this issue. It's, it has to be a combination of law enforcement and um, education, awareness, and, and speed bumps, I believe. Um, just by talking from talking and with the community members, I know that they believe it's the city's responsibility to address these needs. So I don't know how well it would go if we're holding or wanting um, members of our community to actually pay for the speed bumps. And I kind of agree uh, to a certain extent that it is the city's responsibility as their tax dollar, dollars at work. Uh, when addressing uh, these type of safety issues out there. Um, but regardless, uh, you know, definitely we had to, um, we, we tried different things and we have talked about speed bumps for a long time and uh, you're, you're right, there's two sides uh, to, to this, uh, this thing. However, uh, just from uh, being involved in the community, I hear it more towards wanting speed bumps in certain areas, especially residential areas, because they're fed up with cars, you know, blaring down the, the road and, and their kids can't even play in the front yard or nowhere near, ride a bike or anything like that. So um, I, I think it's gone to the point where we need to do no, something, uh, we need to act and, uh, you know, uh, definitely address this as best we can. Uh, do you know how much, uh, how much would it cost for a, a speed? I knew that was coming next. <laughs> so, um, again, you know, because all the, the the streets themselves, you know, some have, you know, they're, they're all characterized and the width of, of the streets themselves are all different. And then, 
and then you also have to, there's, there's a minimum criteria, but in terms of cost, uh, right now it'd be really difficult to, to kind of throw out a number, uh, but uh, I don't know if, if Anthony, you want to take a shot on what, what the cost would be of a, a speed bump, but if, if I had to guess, and just talking with, with the engineering related to some of these, we're, we're looking at uh, anywhere between ten and $15,000. Of course, keep in mind that we have to do everything at, at prevailing wage, and um, and the important thing here is if we do put in speed bumps, they need to be, you know, uh, to the right specifications. Because I know that um, you know some cities put in these uh, rubberized or these uh, plastic, and it just becomes another problem. So we got to do it right. Yeah, you're correct. I think there was a lot of concerns or. Um uh, comments regarding the previous one we had on on F Street, um, mm. the drill ones that you know, they weren't effective at all whatsoever. I've seen. I mean, I've done some research on this, and I've seen like, you know, I mentioned before, Sacramento's done, and other cities, small and big cities, done, and it's more, it's different, you know, uh, more effective as according to the research out there. Um, but definitely, um, we need to do something and um, as soon as possible and address. Addressed yeah, we'll bring this to the next council meeting. It's, this, like I said, this is not difficult at all. We just need to provide um, the traffic committee and the council uh, basically a, a minimum qualifying criteria so that it's just not, you know, anybody put up a speed bump anywhere. You know, you've got to yeah, look at some. a number of, uh, you know, how close is it to a cul-de-sac, you know. Um, stop sign. Yeah, stop sign, you know, 25 feet from... X. So there's there's a minimum qualifying, and so we'll get through that. We'll work with the uh, right staff, and we'll bring council something. and And given the, some direction this evening, we'll basically sounds like focus on city budgeting money to address the speed bumps. I know we have somebody from the traffic commission, correct committee? Um, but that was that was going to be the next question, Jose. Kempa, you answered it. I don't know. What was that again? I said that was, was oh. my next question. Like, how do we determine where we put it? But he answered it. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm going to finish up with council questions, and then uh, we'll open up for public. Any any council? Any other comments or questions? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so I think this is very important. This is also something that I uh, share concerns for a couple of years now, uh, and this is all over. I mean, this is just not just Livingston, but I think this is in many other communities. But um, what I would like to see in, in, in council to consider uh, before is, is brought back to a council meeting to possibly have a workshop and kind of get to here because not everyone in the community is able to be here at the council meeting. So I think having a, a workshop either of, you know, I guess not a workshop or just a meeting with other members in the community and get more feedback and, and, and so by the time it comes to the council, we would be more educated on it, you know, and also looking at all the different options, possibilities, and uh, because we don't want to consider something and install it and then having it not work and then having it to remove it again and, and so on. So that, that would just be my suggestion. It could it be part of uh, the council meeting? I mean, part of the, you're talking about public workshop or for us workshop? Public. That, uh, I guess public. Uh, very similar to what uh, uh, Chief and the other members in the community had before, I think two weeks ago or something like that, and where we can participate and invite more members of the community. And, and if it can be done like here in the council chambers where we can have 15, 20 people or whatever number is allowed, will be better. I think uh, in, we could do it in collaboration with the traffic um, committee and maybe PD. Um, uh, just a collaboration, have a, some public uh, opportunity for feedback and education. And, and we could do that. I think the last time, how long ago was the, the pre, we guess had a Zoom meeting or something like that, right? Again? Okay. This week? Okay. So maybe, I mean, we, we honestly, I want to move as soon as possible on this. Um, so we, let, let's get let's let's get organized and do it. Um, I'll open it up for a public comment. If you guys want to share anything, oh, hello. Sorry, uh, uh, Councilwoman Maria. Go ahead. As part of it being a, the traffic committee, um, 
I don't know what consideration. I haven't been to once. So when is the date for your Zoom meeting? Okay, perfect. Um, but also with our Livingston PD, I know that uh, these, these are really highly speeding areas. So if there could be units out there rather than some of them, you know, I, I see them, you know, at the at value market or over there by Livingston Community Health, over there by Walnut, um, in areas that aren't as busy. So again, just kind of taking control of, of those areas and better use of our officers to be actually in those areas rather than, I know we've, you've tried it before with the, the decoy ones, but again, our citizens get used to that and they ignore it. So I think if, if there was an actual presence there to slow, slow down, you know, obeying those laws. And again, appreciating the, the mention of workshops, I think we could all use a refresher course of uh, Drivers Ed 101, you know, um, because there are a lot of uh, rules and that our citizens just aren't abiding by and maybe they're forgotten or they got their license just because they earned it, but uh, again, our, our driving habits just need to be revisited and also, you know, reinforced through our officers through, throughout the town. So I'm thinking that if, if there was a bigger presence of officers in, in those highly trafficked areas, maybe the speeding will go down. They will be cautious. Uh, again, I've seen people go through school zones during when children are present and that upsets me uh, to no end. But again, having them present during those highly trafficked times would be a, 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 a great help. Thank you. I'm Ronald Mallory. I'm the pastor at Emmanuel Baptist Church right across the street from the high school. Letty and I are both former members of the traffic committee before this council. Um, we worked with Chief, Chief Sir, Sir, the past chief, We've been working with the current chief. I understand that they are now understaffed from where we were last year. Yes, it would be great to have those police on duty. They used to park right at the parking lot, right behind the sign on our church property with wonderful permission. I'd even give them the oranges from our tree just because at when the school was letting out, the kids would be speeding by. The speed, I'm gonna jump all around here. The speed bumps we were told at that time were about $30,000. Um, I understand there was a speed bump on F Street that was literally put in on top of the street, and that was a major problem and why a lot of people are against it. I've been dealing with one of the gentlemen from another church, uh, was totally against speed bumps, and then I explained to him, which I really want to bring forward here, which is more expensive, the speed bumps or having another accident, Esmeralda and her friend almost killed eight years ago right there by the high school. The police car hit right on Park Street. The 99 cent truck that sits right next door to the Portigee Hall getting hit in the, in the middle of the night. The car on I Street that was hit the day of the last council, the traffic meeting that we had, the car that destroyed the bus stop sitting in the middle of our parking lot practically Who's, how's, what's it going to take? Somebody dying before we get these speed bumps? Whose kid or parent or loved one is going to have to die? And I mean, that's just Main Street. I'm hearing it on other, other streets as well. Yes, we need more police. Yes, we need more protection. Yes, I know it's expensive. When that gentleman was in here earlier, Proposition B or something or other B, maybe something can be done with that. It sounds like traffic could be involved in using some of those funds. The other problem we're having, you just got done resealing the streets out here. Why bother with the trucks coming through when they're not supposed to be, they're supposed to be on Robin, they're coming through on these, I mean, semis coming through left and right. I know Chief has already evidently been in touch with Foster Farms because we've had trucks leaving from Foster Farms down Main Street. They're not supposed to be there. I had a, uh, one of those, what do we call them, dualies, where there's a t truck, uh, uh, basket type thing behind the other one. He park, was parking his right on I Street across from the, from the library. Guys, please, we need something done with traffic. And the police need more support. Please, 
Thank you. Thank Clark, you. Any questions? No, okay. thank you. Uh, I totally in agreement with you. I, I actually responded to that bus stop call, and I agree. Um, I agree with you totally. Thank you. Hi, um, Mayor, City Council members. I'm Letty. I'm part of the uh, traffic committee, and I want to clarify because I feel like there's a lot of confusion. Um, we have a traffic committee that involves residents, and we get to collaborate with the chief, but I also understand that the chief has a different traffic committee um, where city engineer, public works, um, fire department are involved, and they're the ones that get to have those discussions. Um, we're supposed to get invited to those meetings. I have not yet been invited to them. I don't know if you've had meetings um, since we last met, but I would love to, Ron and I would love to come by and just collaborate and talk to um, the decision makers or your committee. Um, we're having a meeting on Thursday, May 6th at 6.30, um, 1310 M Street, um, Baptist Church, right across from the park. Um, we are having a Zoom meeting, but if somebody feels more comfortable coming to the church, pastor has a big area, so we can, um, we're wearing masks all the time, um, and we social distance, so whoever wants to come by, you're welcome to come by. I think, um, as Council Member Moran suggested, I don't like the idea of residents paying for speed bumps, um, but then again, that's just my opinion, and I don't want to speak for everybody. I think that I like the idea of having workshops where we can hear from the rest of the residents and feel and see how they would like to approach these situations. I don't think that we should be making decisions for residents, um, especially when it comes to income or spending money out of their pockets. Um, so definitely workshops would be amazing and it would be a good idea to do them when um, people could actually attend. Um, I don't know when that would be and I know it's really hard because even for our meetings, not a lot of people attend, but I think that if we give it time, uh, people will get more involved because I do know that traffic concerns and speeding is a very, very big issue. Um, I'm having people speed on my street, which is Briarwood, uh, where I live, which is really scary. Um, and it's come to the point where we need to do something about it. And I, um, I propose that you know, workshops, the workshops would be really, really beneficial to engage in that dialogue with residents before any of you make a decision for us, um, especially when it comes to paying for speed bumps. Um, and that's it, thank you. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Good evening, Council. My name is Hilda Lopez and I live at 2279 Burgundy Drive. Burgundy is actually um, off of Hammett and runs parallel to Peach. Um, the street runs for almost uh, half a mile undisturbed of any type of traffic control devices, which clearly is a huge issue within our community. Um, in preparation for tonight, I went and canvassed my community to gather the support of my neighbors. And along with their support, I actually gathered all their stories. As council probably knows, that's how it goes when you talk to your community. Um, and they express the same concerns that everybody's expressed here tonight. Um, the inability to be safe as pedestrians, the noise pollution, the chronic traffic um, that we have to deal with. Um, it, it is concerning and we have all gathered and I would like to actually present um, council with a petition, a formal petition um, tonight on behalf of myself and all the individuals within our, uh, my neighborhood to, for the city to install uh, tr speed bumps or traffic control devices on our street. Um, never once did I tell them that it was going to cost them. So yeah. I really hope I don't have to go back and tell them that because if you're going to appoint one community person, I guarantee it's going to be me for my neighborhood. So I'd like to present this to you tonight and I hope that you guys will take action swiftly because the last thing I would want is a dangerous situation to turn tragic. Thank, Thank you. you. You want to provide it to Monica, please? But no, I'll definitely agree with you. I think um, their taxpayer dollars should be paying for this project. Um, and then those, those streets you guys mentioned are one of the highest uh, issues we've had. I mean, there's been accidents there and um, you know, pedestrian stuff, uh, vehicle versus pedestrian, you know, multiple times in different locations throughout the years, as far as I can remember. Um, so, and you're right about but your street, there's uh, not even a stop sign, and <laughs> that's pretty, which is crazy. 
um, not even a stop sign. So we need to do something as soon as possible. I know that I agree with the workshops. It's good to always engage um, engage everybody and make sure everybody's uh, informed. Um, but let's do it. Let's do it fast soon um, to get it going as soon as possible. As you guys already know, government, you know, things take time and, and there's a pro always a process, but the sooner we start, the better. Um, Chief, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to say one thing. Yeah, I have gotten a lot of complaints on Burgundy because of the fact that it is a long thoroughfare. Uh, that was one of the things that, and I will be getting in touch with you. We are going to be having a meeting at the end of the, end of the month. Um, and that's one of the things because that was depending on what direction we get tonight or soon thereafter on speed bumps. That was actually one of the places that I wanted to, I was going to talk with Anthony and the rest of the, the committee members of actually putting it because I've gotten more complaints on that street than any street. And I mean, I've gotten them everywhere actually, but that is probably one of the main ones um, that I've gotten a lot of calls. So um, I I'm hearing you. Um, and we're trying to do what we can, but you know, unfortunately, there's again, there's there's not a lot of a, a lot of us. Um, sometimes there's only two of us. So, but we do what we can. Um, and again, but I go back to anybody who, and they have been. I've been getting a lot more calls where, even if you see somebody speeding, and we can't prove it, but but you know where they're at, call us. We'll go over there and we'll at least talk to them. You know, sometimes it stops. A lot of times, unfortunately, it doesn't. Um, but but we don't need to catch them in the act to, to where we can be proactive and go out there and at least tell them, hey, we're watching you. If you continue, this is what's going to happen. So, but um, no, I, I have been hearing a lot of a lot of you over on Burgundy, and I, and, I, and I am aware of it. So hopefully we can address it pretty soon. Go ahead. I'm sorry, we can't hear the question. Can you please come to the mic? Oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, go to the microphone. People in the, out there can't hear you. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I was just expressing that uh, within my neighborhood on Burgundy Drive, there is not a lack of uh, police uh, support in order to support or to, um, to make our uh, neighborhood any safer. I live on the street. I am routinely out in my front yard, and I see the you know police patrolling and PD making an active presence. That's not the issue. The issue is truly that there is a lack of traffic control devices. This street is, like I mentioned, almost a half a mile long. No stop signs, no speed bumps, nothing. It serves as a perfect expressway, but our PD cannot be in one place at every place at every moment. It's difficult. They are understaffed. They are doing a wonderful job, but we need more support from our city council. Thank you. Go ahead. One more. Oh, just one thing real quick. Oh, you yeah. come on in. Um, I, I provided Anthony tonight uh, an actual form that a lot of other cities are using. Uh, I want to thank Sergeant Kang for actually uh, coming up with the form. He actually, I think he plagiarized it from another, from another agency. But, but hey, if it's working, hey, take it from him. But anyway, he has it, and hopefully he can present it to the city manager and, and show you guys as well. But uh, it, I mean, we're already halfway there because they have the petitions because that's part of it. Uh, that we got to get the buy-in from that portion of that community. So, I get, he has it now. Oh, come on. Thank you. I would just like to know if it's legal, so probably asking your legal guy. I have been filming some of these guys speeding. I've been filming the traffic and what's going on, the trucks, etc. Is that legal to post online? Trevor? Uh, I mean, video you're taking from a public vantage point of a, of a public activity, um, you're free to do use in your own personal manner. Also to address also the trucks, Anthony had just posted new signs that actually state now in big yellow lettering, they cannot drive. We've actually been stopping them. I stopped a few. Uh, so we are addressing that as well. 
Um, there are signs up that basically state, uh, I think it says something about no through trucks, 10,000 pounds or more, gives the LMC code roundabout ahead. So they, we're going to start addressing that quite a bit. Thank you, Chief. We're going to get back to council for uh, direction, staff. Do you guys think you guys have enough to move forward? Yes, awesome. Okay, so we'll definitely get on it. Um, you know, it's the faster we act on it, the the potential to save lives, and it, it is you know it's there. So we need to act on it. So thank you so much for everything. Thank you for uh, your uh, time um, in this committee and and coming out your work with a petition and all that good stuff. So good stuff. We'll, we'll uh, definitely schedule a workshop as soon as possible. Uh, we've been thinking as early as uh, as next week. So and then move on from there. So I appreciate everybody's work on this. So we're gonna move on uh, to item number 11, which is discussion and action in establishing the Spain and neutering program in the city of Livingston. Thank you. Who else this item? Uh, okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, Chief's coming up. Oh, the police chief's coming. Uh, we're going to talk about it first, and I'll open oh. up for public comment. Well, actually, I want to thank uh, Kristen Hill, our animal control officer. She, We already pretty much came up with the with a program uh, that we can actually submit or put out. Um, most, most from what we see from other agencies, they don't make it a municipal code. It's just basically a program within the police department because normally the police, I mean, animal control falls under the police department. But uh, I do have it. Uh, if you guys want to hear it, I can basically tell you what it consists of. Um, that's, that this is how Turlock does it, but, but basically we would basically do it the same way. It's, uh, we would only issue three uh, vouchers per household. Uh, each pest, pet must be microchipped um, before getting the, the spay or neuter. Has to be a city resident. Uh, all dogs must be licensed. Um, and then the copay would have to be done prior to actually get, get given releasing the funding or the voucher for them going to. We've already talked to. I believe it was. Uh, I, I don't know. I think it's Turlock, one of the yeah one of the places up in Turlock. She works with that they would do it just like they do it with Turlock. Um, but yeah, it's it's a very easy thing to do and get going. It, it's just finding the money to actually do it. And we would actually, unless finance would have some other uh, ideas of how we would keep the money, but it would basically be, be taken in by us, like other things are done as well, and we would make sure we would manage it within uh, the budget. Thank you, Chief. Um, Council, any questions for Chief? Um, yeah, I have a question for Victoria. You're saying this will come out of the police fund? I don't know where the money actually would come out right now because we have, I don't think we've uh, identified where that's coming from. Thank you. Go Does ahead, finance have no. an answer to that question? What was that again? Does finance know where the money's coming from or the city manager? Oh, yes, Council Member King, uh, that, that's something that uh, we have our budget workshop that's coming up. So uh, basically the only funds available for something like this would be under the general fund category. So it's up to Council and you guys can... Uh, uh, move amount, move a certain dollar amount that you guys feel is uh, sufficient for this program, as just as well as other programs. And we would manage it. And the police department would manage that through animal control. Correct. Okay. Go ahead, Council Member Jose Mora. Your question. Yes. So, thank you for uh, doing all, all the work and, and kind of figuring out what other agencies are already doing and kind of picking up from them what's really working. Um, on, on the program, uh, and I don't, we don't have all, the, all of the details, you, you, you did mention a few of them. Uh, what would be the copay that, um, that other agencies are doing or that you have in mind? Or? Uh, it'd be $50 for dogs and 20 for cats, uh, no ferals. Um, and 
it'd be 65 if uh, a rabies vaccination was required. Okay. All right. And then, and then again, what is that all size dogs? Because obviously they're little tiny ones, and and they kind of base that on, on on the weight of the dog versus you know a, a big dog, which I, is more expensive. I have nothing in here that states anything otherwise. Um, I mean, I've used actually I've used this program a couple times, and um, and I don't think it matters. At least it didn't to me when I did it. Okay. So yeah. All right. Thank you. Council, any other questions? Yes, I got another question. It's for the chief. I noticed Iowa, the city of Iowa had this program before, but it seemed like they canceled it. Can you find out from them, like, why didn't it work out? What was the reason for them canceling it? Yeah, I can find out, yes. Uh, Thank I, you, sir. Yeah, I actually contacted Turlock, and it seems to be working for them. So. Sounds good. Okay. Um, any other questions, council, at this time? All right, we're going to open it up for public comment at this time. Before you go to public, um, can oh. I report that I received um, three emails in support of the spay and neuter program. The emails were provided to the council. Thank you so much, and we did receive those emails in support. Thank you. Um, public comment? Anybody want to comment on this item? Go ahead. Good evening, my name is Flor, and I'm a resident here in Fern Livingston for 30 years. And I never see this program before here in Livingston, or I don't know if I lost my mind, um, but I think for sure, this is the time that we need um, this kind of programs for the dogs, cat, and also, and, and I want to say something that, um, like you guys know right now, what time is it? It's going to be 10 o'clock p.m. So most of the people that is not here right now, they, they need to work. So I'm going to talk for these people too. And like one time there was a lady that she told me that she couldn't take her dog to the bed because she, she don't have a right. And I think the puppy, I, it was sick, she needed their shot, you know, like. So, um, also, I want to say that um, mostly the people that we live here in Livingston, mostly the people that I know, they work in the fields, they can't afford um, to take the, their pet to the bed. So, I would like to see one day here in Livingston, before I die, <laughs> like there's a, a a clinic for the dogs here on Livingston. And no matter if it's a small, like a small building, like there's a lot of empty buildings right now. I know, but uh, okay. And like Mr. Um, sorry I say that the, um, the, um, uh, Maybe the, they can get like more funds to get for their rabies. Um, and I hope they can get more funds. And and today, um, uh, one of my dogs died because, um, yeah, I couldn't afford um, to pay like close to $900. So is why I'm asking this. And I hope um, you guys like soon we can have these kind of programs and not only one time, please. We need these programs like maybe like twice a year. And and I was thinking, like you guys said, like, where are you guys going to get the funds? Or oh, I was thinking, like, residents, like, oh, because it's going to be the residents, the benefit of these programs. So we can get the money for these residents. How? Maybe 
asking like for donations and send when you guys send the 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 water bill, you can ask like um or it's going I, I say like I say uh, it's going to be like only three two times a year. So only three times a year so we're going to ask for this money. It's not going to be like every month, every month, every month. So I think we can do it. Also, um, if you guys need my help, like volunteer with these kind of programs and uh, talking to the people, or do you guys need like signs of the people? Oh, I can do that. So, I don't know. You guys have any questions? Yes, I got a Trevor, can you ask this one for me? So, can we charge the residents for, for this with the water bill? Oh, excuse me, I didn't hear you. No, he's, talk, he's asking to the attorney. Oh. So, I mean, the water, water charges need to be directly related to the service that's provided to the customer. Um, so, it, it can't be included in the water charge itself. If, um, if, there, if there was a different mechanism in which you wanted to impose the fee, it would not need to be, excuse me, it would be required to not be tied to... Um, a prop to 18 type fee like water. Thank you, Okay, Trevor. thank you. My second question is, I um, mean, we were just talking about neutering and she's talking about medical bills for for the illness of the dog. Are we on the same topic or we're two different topics? I think she was just advocating for, in general, more pet oh. services, uh, including a hospital or a vet here in town. Um, which thank is, you, Mayor. Uh, but thank you for your comment. We appreciate it, okay? Thank you so much. Any other public comment? Thank you. For Paul Samara. Uh, Mr. Mayor, may I make a quick suggestion? I, I'm completely unrelated, but take about five seconds. May I, with your permission? Uh, I know when people are phoning in, it's, it becomes very disruptive. A suggestion, an idea to you folks is maybe have the elected officials call on a different line so they're always on and figure out a way to mute everybody until you open up for comedy. It's very distracting and disruptive, so just a suggestion, okay? Uh, to me, on this, uh, on this item, I think uh, you folks need to kind of work out the logistics, how to pay for it, but it is a, definitely a good program. Uh, we're all used to seeing cats and dogs and out there, and then you know, and then there are folks out there trying to get them uh, adopted somewhere, and there's kittens dead on the road, you know, because nobody's, you know. So if something can be low cost or mixed year, something can be worked out. I don't know what it's going to cost. That's what you uh, you have great finance people that I help you guys out. But if something can be implemented, I highly suggest that five of you guys get together and work something out. And the budget is coming up anyway, so. I think it's a really good program to move forward. Thank you for your uh, time. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Any other public comment at this time? So we'll bring it back to council. Um, so tonight's discussion is a, a discussion in action, right? So as far as I could hear, um, we have identified a, a, a blueprint for a program that's being, uh, you know, uh, used in the city of Turlock which it sounds like it's an effective program, um, a successful program over there in Turlock. And the only concern or challenge at this time will be finding money. Uh, do we have any approximate estimate? How much it will cost? How much do we want to invest? How much co-share are we going to have or anything like that at this time? A ballpark figure? How much the city of Turlock used or maybe the city of Atwater used in the past? Can we figure something like that out and find out? I can yeah. find out what their, what their budgets are. I'm sure it's going to be somewhat higher because obviously yeah, the it's population city. is yeah. bigger. Yeah. But maybe you could, you know, you could get an idea how much it'll cost or, and then base it off our population. Or, or, um, but I know, there, when's the, uh, I know workshops are coming up, so that will be a good opportunity to identify some funding sources and 
and we could go from there. I mean, um, I know obviously I hear from everybody that's a, that's an issue, a problem. Um, obviously, it's this could be part of a solution, but I know obviously there's other parts to to addressing this, like awareness, education, being proactive, um, and also holding the owners accountable uh, as well. You know, um, by education or um, consequence. Um, I'm going to run out of time, guys. Sorry. Go. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? If I may, Mayor, uh, thank you. So I think that, um, you know, uh, this is something that we need to look at very seriously. I mean, it's not something that has been, that just has been happening for a year. This is, this is something that has evolved from years of neglect, of years of not paying attention to these issues. Uh, but, I mean, we are here now, and I think we are, uh, uh, you know, something needs to be done. Um, I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not the only one that has received concerns of people sometimes not even feeling comfortable going for a walk anymore, or if they, if they go for a walk, now they're carrying, I mean, I think I, I figure it out why they're carrying sticks now, you know, because uh, they're just afraid of, stray dogs out there sometimes um, and, and so and there's a difference also just to uh, um, clarify there's a difference between a program for for stray cats and dogs versus for a program that we're looking at for for spay and neuter program for residents pets um, I do believe that the city of, of Outwater had a a previous program a spay and neuter actually it was a trap neuter and release program for stray cats, which is different, totally different from what we're, we're looking at and considering at this moment. So, um, but, and then also to address some of the other concerns, and I, I do want to say thank you to everyone that has, you know, taken the time to come out here and comment or send emails or called in. Um, I think it's very important, and I'm also I'm also going to commit myself to continue looking for programs <coughs> and to hopefully try and bring back the low cost vaccine clinics that we did last year, that was something very successful for our community and, and very much needed. So in addition to, to trying to work on the spay and neuter program, I will look into trying and work with other agencies to bring in, to, ag to again bring in the low cost vaccine clinics for pets, uh, which, you know, they work very well. And, uh, um, and I think that uh, I would appreciate the support uh, on something like this to move forward. <clears throat> Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, definitely important program. Um, I think we just need to uh, have that discussion in regards to funding uh, coming up here with the workshops, uh, our budget workshops. Um, if we could find out that information, how much it will cost, at least you have an idea to go off of, um, see how much we need to invest and all that good stuff. But um, so staff, I think you guys have good direction, correct? Um, I mean, I think we, we identified something that could work, it sounds like, and we have a blueprint. We just need to figure out how we're going to fund it. I'd also like to see um, us utilize our, our, I know we've, you've talked to Turlock and, and Atwater again, getting all those resources, those mobile units that actually come out to uh, other cities. So if we can get that kind of information as well, so that we can take advantage of of what other cities are doing for spay and neuters and, and vaccinations, so that that would even lower costs to our residents if we can use what other cities are using as well. And then also waiting for our workshop to actually dis to decide on anything. And then just that leads into also, like I mentioned in the past, you know, I know there's some grant opportunities out there or partnerships we could do. So. I, I mean, obviously, as a staff, you guys are always looking out for that kind of stuff. So, but just being proactive and, and looking into any opportunities that come up in regards to partnering with any nonprofits or any organizations or gr small grants from state level or federal level. And I mean, obviously, that's always always good, you know. Um, if I can, I just ask legal real quick. Um, this one is is. Um written as discussion and action versus discussion and direction. What are we supposed to be doing? I mean, 
we gave direction, but this is written as discussion and action. Can you please advise? It sounds like the council, I mean, it's written in a way in which council could take action to establish the program. From what I've heard, it sounds like council would like more information on how the program itself is going to be funded before making any formal decision on enacting the program. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, guys. <clears throat> we'll move on to our last item, which is the resolution adopting the revisions to the classification specifications of water wastewater operator one, two, and three, um, <clears throat> uh, manager job descriptions and corresponding salary schedule for water wastewater manager. Uh, good evening, Council. A little bit of background on the staff report you have before you. City of Livingston Water wastewater series classification were last visited in 2019, created by Ewing. Uh, practices and procedures of the department have changed since integrating water and wastewater operations together. The main goal with creating one department of dual certified operators is so that they can accommodate the city in either capacity, being water or wastewater. Revisions have been made to the classification so that none of the classifications seem one-sided and this gives the city flexibility to utilize their operators what best suits the city. So currently, as, it's, as it stands, our operator three uh, classification job description is kind of one-sided toward wastewater. Our operator two classification is kind of one-sided toward water. And our operator one was written better and it uh, has water and wastewater job description duties. So the re revisions made were to the operator two and operator three, um, implementing both water and wastewater duties as they're currently doing. Also, staff has reviewed the uh, current salary structure for the water and wastewater manager classification and recommends to increase the salary structure by 10%. Uh, this will attract uh, those individuals in this competitive environment for this type of position. To date, the percentage between the water wastewater manager classification and the water wastewater operator three classification is below two percent which is way below the norm of the five percent minimum okay now why that happened is because there was nobody in that water wastewater manager position uh, during this last mou we had three different uh, cost of living increases so those cost of living increases were um, increase and in seen in the uh, operator one, two, and three salary schedule, but the manager position, since nobody was filling that, was in that position, didn't see the increases. So that's why the uh, two, it's too close. The salary structure is way too close. It doesn't have that buffer. We're also asking for 10% instead of 5% due to uh, the state resource control board um, has also reclassified our well 16 treatment site from a grade two plant to a grade three that means that the chief plan operator will have to have a grade three water treatment certification. Um, at this time, none of our operations staff does have the T3. Uh, the TCP treatment added to the complexity of the operations at that well 16 plant, so that's why the state is requiring a higher certification. So I do have a T3 right now, so we are in compliance still with the state uh, regulation. Uh, with that said, staff is asking for approval for the job description revisions and the man, uh, manager salary adjustment. We'll be happy to answer any questions that council may have. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Bring it back to council for questions. Yes, I, I have a couple questions on this. Hey, hold on, hold on, uh, council member Jose Moran. <clears throat> approach first. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just real quick, I, I know that I had some previous questions about a month ago, and when this first came up to the council and, and you were able to answer all of those questions. But something that I was just thinking about since, and I don't know if this case, I don't, and I don't know if this case, and I don't know if this can be discussed right now or, uh, but since you are recommending a 10% increase in salary, would there be an additional change once um, salary increases are negotiated? for this particular, so it will be this, plus whatever else is negotiated, so, okay. 
And that goes the same for the operator one, operator two, and operator three. Whatever negotiations are uh, uh, given or concessions are, are given uh, during that MOU, that salary schedule would be adjusted as well. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of reading, but a lot of information and trying to process all of the data. It's, uh, but um, at this moment, I have no more questions. But I reserve the right to ask more questions. <laughs> Council, any other questions? Yes, I got a couple questions. Go ahead. One about the wastewater manager. Who is somebody doing that position right now? I'm currently um, satisfying the chief planned operator um, duties for the wastewater side. Um, as far as legal requirements uh, need to be met for chief plan operator duties. Um, also, uh, our superintendent, Tony uh, Avina, is taking care currently of the uh, legal responsibilities being the chief plan operator at the water site for the water treatment systems. So, how important is this job? Because I've noticed I did the math. It's a $95,000 a year salary plus we're in negotiation. We don't know what that looks like right now. And uh, serve like a medical package, it's like a $140,000 job. How badly do we need this? Is well, there something this you could do under your license? Um, yeah, I would say yes and no. I mean, that's a, there's a lot of job responsibility there. There's a lot, there's a, um, it's a, it's a, a, quite a substantial requirement to oversee these uh, um, legal responsibilities, overseeing staff. Um, it would be a, a, a disservice, I think, to the, our, our operations crew. Um, it'd be very hard to, to juggle both positions, uh, the public works director position and trying to accommodate and take care of the uh, operations side as well. Um, I think our residents deserve to have a full-time uh, employee overseeing this area, this department. It's crucial. It's his safety and, and health. Um, but uh, I can, and I have been taking care of the compliance side for right now, just to keep us compliant. Um, and I'll have to do that temporary as uh, we transition uh, our well 16 production, because they, we will be required to be a T3. And I currently have our T3, so we will be in compliance still until we are able to um, Field the manager position. So who was doing this job before and well, why did we let him go or what's going on with that position? Well, I don't know if I could um, talk too much about employees right now, but I not mention any names. Okay, so do we, uh, my question is, is this a new position you're creating or was create, creating or somebody it, else was in It's this not a new before? position, but we, are, we will be asking to, uh, to we are, we'll be budgeting for this position for this next fiscal year. It just, it was not filled. But duties were priorly performed by one of our operators. Okay, yeah, my, my, my one question was, I was just, I noticed the citizens are more complaining about the fireworks, the speed bump. Is there any way this position could hold off the next fiscal year? And we, we deal with the other problems that, are, that we're having with the cities or is, how important is this to you? Um, I think it's very important for the community as far as uh, health and safety goes. Um, but this is something that we are budgeting for for this next fiscal year. Any further questions on the phone? Nope. That'd be it. Maria, do you have any questions? <clears throat> I have a couple questions um, or just general thoughts. Uh, this this item right here is just reclassifying, right? It's not really approval to hire a position or anything like that. Sagan, Mayor. So this is just a resolution uh, adopting a revision to the classification, right? It's not. A, uh, yes, this is a, a to the revisions approving the re revisions of the operator one, two, and three uh, job description revision, and also for the salary for the water wastewater manager. This isn't to so, appoint anybody or. Yeah, so, so if council was not to uh, budget any money as part of our, our, our budget workshop, then we wouldn't be able to fill that. But 
you're, so it's correct what you're saying. Okay, so yeah, because the way I see it, just reading it, it sounds like it's just a revision and looking at the different schedules, but not actually asking until we have our workshops. Until we have yes. money, we can. Yeah. Until we have the money to act, or identify the money to yeah. fund yes. the position. So I know we were having workshops still. Um, finance, do you have any, any input in, in this regards to this position or how budget is shaping up in regards to allocating money for such position or just a finance point of view, I guess, I'm asking for. We are expected to hold uh, the first budget workshop uh, next May 20th. It's the date that we are targeting to hold this workshop. And this is one of the positions that it's been recommended in our water and sewer budget to be approved and re reviewed and, um, and it will be up to council. This is 100% funded from uh, the enterprise funds. So there isn't any, um, there wouldn't be any impact to the general fund, but um, it is part of the budget workshops that are coming up. Perfect, thank you. I want, that's exactly what kind of one I wanted to get, like if it was gonna have an impact to a general fund or um, fiscally, if it was gonna be an issue hiring an additional position and we could hire like a firefighter instead or a police officer, but it'll be spe it's specific to, to that department. Um, you know, obviously with negotiations and that 10%. Mayor, we're having a hard time hearing you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, a lot better. Uh, just with the um, same thing, the, the structure of salary, the 10% bump up, um, is that something that was discussed or are you seeing other jurisdictions being more competitive? What was the reason be behind the Just trying step? to implement a, a buffer. Normally it's a 5% uh, um, separation between salary schedules, but due to the uh, State Water Resource Control Board um, up in the ante on us and requiring us to have a grade three water treatment uh, operator now to be the chief plan operator, um, that forces us to uh, uh, have the operators or the, the water wastewater managers to hold that certification. Um, originally that wasn't accounted for, but we asked for another 5% uh, to accommodate that. So that's why we asked for 10 instead of five. Can we do a 5% buffer? Can, it's up to council. Just, oh, and same thing, I'm trying to consider negotiations and just being uh, fiscally responsible. I got something. Yeah, you can do fine. Go ahead, you had a comment? Yeah, it's the mayor pro Um uh, I just think the timing of this right now with negotiations is probably a, a bad one, just my opinion, due to the fact that, I mean, less than a 10% on top of whatever uh, comes out of our negotiation, negotiations here in the next couple of weeks. So. I just think we probably need to come back after uh, the negotiation side. I don't know what else is uh, any. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, um, Council. Any other comments or questions? Five or um, what I'm thinking that um, that even even if we come back with after negotiations, the the gap is still going to be there. It's not going to. You know, um, that buffer is still going to be needed. So, you know, because that negotiations is going to affect everyone, not just some positions. So, even if we come back after nego negotiations, is I don't see how it would make a difference. Um, but And then again, this is something that could always be revisited, and maybe I would feel more comfortable with 5% instead of 10%. And you know, in the near future, this could be addressed again if needed. If, if, we, if, if you see that we're not getting um, someone that, is, that has all, all of the requirements that is needed to fill what they, their responsibilities and, and um, and then we can always, re can we always re get it brought back and readjust it if needed? Because I guess from one of the questions that I asked before was 
that because they have more requirements, this person might not be interested enough in that position because there's, they're not getting paid enough compared to the other operators that don't have as many responsibilities. That's correct. It, it will be hard to attract a, a, a manager to be the chief plan operator. And the chief plan operator uh, is in the job description on the water sewer manager to be the chief plan operator for water and wastewater. Um, our operator three position, if there's not a, a correct buffer between the two, it's gonna be very, very difficult to have somebody commit to be the manager because the operator three salary schedule will be so close and there's a huge responsibility difference there. So it's gonna be very hard to, to fill if we don't have that proper buffer between the two and the salary schedule. Um, so in leaving, I guess for a better, broader picture, more of a visual picture, what does the 5% represent in dollar amount versus the 10%? So, you know, or versus what the previous, well, I, I know that I have it here, but just so that public. I, I don't have that dollar amount in front of me. I just council member King again. Is there any way we could bring back this position after the, the budget? I know that we're only a month, month and a half away. Like, we don't know where we're standing right now, so why are a position that we can't afford? I know it's in the budget, but we have the neuter program we're trying to do. Our new officers, the firefighters. With this position, I noticed with other supervisors, we have brand new take-home trucks. Is that, is that going to be an, on top of this? The $30,000 truck, we have that is, the numbers keep adding up. With the, the medical package, we're looking at like 150, 160 with the vehicle take home. So I would recommend council, my opinion, to just take the manager position off until the budget, and then they're on it. Yeah, definitely come back to this position. It's only a few months. Council Member Kang, just, just to provide you with additional information. The funds for, for this specific, specific position is out of the enterprise fund, so there is no uh, general fund money used. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Vanessa. Yes, 5% uh, salary would be, represent, would be represent at the lowest of the scale, about $3,500 per year, and at the highest, which is East step E, $4,300 a year. Um, and if um, right now the difference between those two positions, just salary, not including benefits, from what you're seeing, it's between 7000 to um, 8600 annually in salary. I got a question for Vanessa. You. you know, we have the water rates going, coming in front of us in a couple months. What happens if they don't go up? How is this position going to affect us then? The position right now, the rates are are um, built, including to have a water and waste water manager in oversight in the, in this um, within the funds, and um, it, it will be right right now. the The rates are built to accommodate for the for that position. Yeah, and yeah, the, but I, that's what I mean. What happens if council doesn't decide to move forward with the rate? The position right now is vacant, so there is some... Yeah, some the position is vacant, need. and the the actual uh, rate increases are not to take into effect until August. Yeah, that's what I mean. Can we wait until August for this position, see where the council decides on on the water rate? Well, I think we're, I think we're getting away from the... Subjects is right now. Once again, I, I just see a reclassification, and then we still need to have our workshops to talk to if we could even fund it in the first place. Uh, so right now we're not talking about hiring, correct? We're not. Correct. We're, we're gonna have a. It's not out for uh, applications, right? It's just a revision, correct? And just for my own personal 
thinking about negotiations and being, like I said, responsible, physically responsible. I'll be more comfortable with the 5% because in negotiations, if they have higher, higher, uh, 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 higher, um, not permits, but higher uh, classification, higher uh, certification. certification. There you go. Thank you. That that could be a point of negotiation, um, and they could get whatever asked for more. And then, because uh, uh, from experience, that's going to happen. They're going to ask for more because they have certain specific certifications nobody else has. Um, so that's going to be the point of negotiation, and they could be rewarded in that way. Because if we do 10% right now, they're going to ask for more because they're the only ones with that certification. That makes sense. So I'm just, I know it, I'm just trying to be fiscally responsible, just considering our, our current situation, because uh, I know that's going to come up. Yeah, I have another one. Can Trevor clear that up? So if this resolution does adopt, does this that mean that is, is this a workshop or this is a done deal? Trevor? So if you're adopting the resolution, it is establishing the job classification for the particular position. It doesn't commit to the council to hiring a specific person. It just establishes the job classification. So just, beside, just to be clear, besides salary, it's talking about what each position is required to have if in the future that's something that we want to put out for uh, hiring, correct? So it's not only salary, but it's like requirements and all that good stuff, right? Is that correct? That's correct. I'll take it out to public comment. <laughs> Any comment from the public? I don't hear anything. I'll bring it back to council. What's uh, any further comment or um, motions? And considering the five percent, oh, if anybody wants to consider the five percent when making the motion. Well, can I make a motion? Well, can I change it a little bit? What was it? What's the change you want to? I make? would like to make the motion, but take the the new position out for right now. Uh, you want to clarify? Yes, I would. President uh, adopting the vision of Calis. Hold on a second. Calification specialist of the water wastewater operator one, water wastewater operator two, water wastewater operator three. And that's that's it. Stop right there. And just take the manager position off. Tre Trevor, you wanna? Uh, is that possible, or does it have to come in as a risk, as a packet, or? Uh, so it sounds like Councilmember Kang is proposing uh, a motion to revise the resolution to remove the wastewater manage or job description from approval. And I'm assuming, Councilor Kang, you're also referring to the corresponding exhibit to that position as well. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. That you don't want to approve of the classification for the wastewater manager job classification as well as salary. Yes. So it's a valid motion. Um, it would require a second and a vote if you receive a second of the council. Oh, uh, second it. Roll call. Council Member Soto? No. Council Member Moran? No. Council Member King? Yes. Mayor Potum Garcia? Yes. Mayor Aguilar? No. Motion fell to a vote of three, two yes and three no. I make a motion to approve the, resolu the uh, resolution adopting the revision to the uh, classification specifications, uh, but with the only 
difference that instead of 10%, that it would be 5%. We have a motion on uh, the table. You have a second? I'll second. Roll call. Council Member Soto? Yes. Council Member Moran? Yes. Council Member King? No. Mayor Potem Garcia? No. Mayor Aguilar? Yes. Motion approved by a vote of 3-0. Three, 3-2. Three, Thank you. Thank you, Monica. At this time, we're going to move on to council direction on future agenda items. Does anybody have any other items? Uh, excuse me. What, what happened to uh, item A? Oh, that we, we, go ahead. Hey, Randy, you, yeah. probably, you probably didn't, <laughs> sorry, but you probably didn't hear, but at the beginning of the, of the meeting, they, uh, they decided to table the item, so I apologize. I didn't even know you were online. Yeah, I've been on since seven. Oh, poor guy. All right, well, we'll, we'll okay. check tomorrow. I apologize. Bye. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry, Randy, I apologize. Um, but yeah, we, we had tabled it for next meeting. I was all ready, okay. I'm sure you were, so I appreciate it, okay? Okay, thanks. Have a good night, you can go to sleep now, sorry. Okay, good night now. Good night. All right, council direction on future agenda items. If you may, Mayor, I'd like to, to yeah, see a... Um, discussion on a uh, re revitalizing, I guess, the, the chamber, Livingston Chamber of Commerce. I'd yeah. also like to have uh, the Rec Commission present. They did work diligently through several months to see what the community wanted in order to name the grassy area across the street. Um, I'm referring to the area between the bank and our historical museum, there there were some there was a, um, a a winner, I should say, that the that was brought to the rec commission if they could present that. And also, I'd like to see us revisit the official city of Livingston website. I know that there's a, a on our on our social media is what I'm referring to, is because there's a lot of things that get lost in the post because our residents are actually using a, a Livingston Community News and we're putting city, you know, it should be shared there as well, but I think we need to promote more of people coming to the City of Livingston website, the official website, and utilizing that for for uh, events and then people can share it from that website to, to the others because I don't think we're pushing our, our website because people are asking for where do I find this, where do I find that and I think we need to, to promote City of Livingston website more on our social media. Yeah, we were trying to reach out to the, uh, the owners or whoever set up the community page because it has a city logo on it and several individuals think it's city sponsored. And so maybe if they can help us out by choosing a different logo, that would be great. There's actually two community groups using the city seal now, just FYI. Um, thank you for that, Maria. Um, for me, um, we'd like to have an item, I mean, we talked about it today, but the actual uh, item from staff regarding the homelessness uh, situation to just make sure we stay updated and. Uh, get all the information that what's happening in regards to staff working on this issue um, and obviously looking forward uh, to the speed bump um, situation workshop and as soon as possible and and uh, uh, item for for um, approval in regards to moving forward um, and then uh, uh, that's it for now uh, Jose what? Uh, yes thank you so actually uh, thank you for touching on a, a couple of items uh, um, uh, one of them being the uh, homeless popula population and seeing how we can partner up or somehow, you know, there's, I know that there are other agencies that have mentioned that they're working together for this with this issue, but I think uh, um, sooner than later, before the problem gets bigger, 
Um, and also, uh, I think somebody else already mentioned it uh, earlier in regards to finding a way or to inquire how can we monitor and end or control those phone calls uh, during council meetings because it's becoming disruptive. And um, uh, one item that I, I would like to see in the next council meeting, um, and I do believe uh, uh, that um, legal is ready to bring, bring this forward, which is the uh, censorship policy. It's been already a few months, and I do believe that, that legal has all of the information that they need to bring this forward um, back to um, council. I was already expecting this a long time ago, but apparently there was there have been no requests from council to bring it back, so I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Any other any other items, council? Okay, at this moment we're going to go ahead and adjourn our meeting at 10:37 p.m. Thank you.